It is certainly not unheard of for a young girl to wake up in the middle of the night, looking for a glass of water. It is somewhat more exceptional when this late night water run results in many, many deaths. Unless, of course, you're dealing with a very special young girl. SCP-053, also known as, well, the young girl. She possesses the innate ability to inspire delusions, paranoia, and eventually homicidal rage in anyone who spends too long around her. Which, as you can probably imagine, makes it hard to live a normal life. One night, the young girl woke up to something incredibly strange. The door of her cell, typically tightly sealed, was wide open, and a strange flashing red light was shining in through the hallway. The sound of a distant alarm is what had woken her up. What the young girl didn't know was that the sight confining her had just experienced a mass containment breach as a result of a major electrical malfunction. Some of the most terrifying creatures imaginable were roaming the halls in search of violence and carnage. But when the young girl got up and wandered out of her bedroom, she only wanted a glass of water to quench her midnight thirst. She wandered down a long, plain hallway, washed intermittently and ran by the red flashing emergency lights. She rubbed the sleep out of her eyes and yawned, all this strange commotion. Maybe she's just having a bad dream. But what seems like a bad dream to her is a bona fide living nightmare for everyone around her. A few halls over, security personnel were being devoured alive by SCP-682. SCP-106, the old man, had just dragged a senior researcher into his pocket dimension to do unspeakable things to him. And a group of terrified admin staff are being lured out by what they think is a group of mobile task force operatives, but is actually a pack of hungry SCP-939 imitating their voices. Still, the young girl persisted in her quest for a refreshing drink, even as security personnel began to fan out through the building, hoping to get control over this rapidly devolving situation. A group of five armed security officers ran into the hallway and attempted to intercept the young girl, but the high stress they were feeling was only accelerated by the effects of the young girl's anomalous powers. They started to feel bugs crawling all over their skin. They started to get the sense that their fellow security officers weren't even people, but monsters wearing human skin suits. Their paranoia soon evolved into a blistering rage. Each of the men pulled out their guns and began firing at each other until only one was left standing, wounded but alive. With all the others dead, the object of his rage now became the young girl herself. He understood then that it was all her doing that she'd made him do this. She was a monstrous little creature who took pleasure in twisting the minds of human beings into terrible forms. In reality, the young girl had no such feelings. Her powers were passive. She had no control over them. She even suffered from some kind of strange mental block that left her completely unaware that her powers were even taking effect. She was, in a sense, completely innocent. As the security officer pointed his gun at the young girl, as she began walking into a nearby break room, he experienced her secondary anomalous effect. Anyone who attempts to hurt her will immediately die from either a heart attack or a stroke. The security officer suddenly felt an intense pain, sharp and brutal, exploding in his chest. He collapsed, dead before he even hit the ground, and the young girl had no idea. She couldn't if she tried. In the break room, the young girl found exactly what she was looking for. A classic office water cooler, complete with a stack of plastic cups. Perfect. She carefully took one of the cups and pulled down the lever on the cooler. Watching her cup fill as the tank above the cooler bubbled, she took a sip. Cool, refreshing spring water. Just what the doctor ordered. But the young girl suddenly looked up, shocked, to see that the tank above the water cooler was now shaking violently as though it was going to explode. What was going on here? Had she broken it? She stepped back, dropping the rest of her cup of water to the ground. She felt frightened. That's when a crack formed in the plastic tank and the water began slithering out, not dripping or pouring, slithering, as though it had moved with mind and purpose. And that's because in this case, it did. The young girl hadn't just drank any water. She had drunk half a cup of water from SCP-054, the water nymph, a mysterious sentient woman made entirely from water. Much like the young girl, the water nymph is often a misunderstood anomaly, one that has received far more harm from the cruel treatment of the SCP Foundation than she's ever given to another. 
She's a naturally curious and compassionate creature whose trust has been abused. So when the contained breach alarm started to sound, much like the rest of the Foundation staff, she had tried to hide and find cover, not wanting to fall into the crosshairs of a far more dangerous and hostile anomaly. She had chosen the water cooler in break room 3, which seemed like a genius idea, until the young girl turned up. After years of being experimented on by Foundation researchers, the water nymph wasn't just about to tolerate more mistreatment. Whatever this strange little creature was who had just consumed some of her body, the water nymph would fight back and make it regret ever thinking that it could take advantage of her. The young girl, who really had just made an innocent mistake, began to panic and run as frightening, slithering tendrils of pure water came slithering after her. As the unfortunate security guard discovered earlier, trying to attack the young girl was typically a one-way ticket to a heart attack or fatal cerebral event. But seeing as the water nymph had neither a heart nor a brain, she was invulnerable, and the young girl was terrified. She ran out of the room, past the bodies of the men who had killed each other due to her influence outside. She wasn't even able to notice them. She kept running, and the water of the water nymph came slithering after her. The water nymph had never been the vengeful type, but after the abuse she'd suffered, she learned the value of putting her liquid foot down. She would not tolerate mistreatment, even from a being this small. The young girl kept running, breathing heavily. Because of the nature of her anomalous abilities, nobody could intervene and help her. Occasionally, she had run into groups of Foundation personnel trying to fight their way through the chaos, only to be anomalously affected and become part of the chaos themselves. They became violent, deranged monsters and started attacking each other, punching and biting. As they fell to the ground in a brawling pile, the young girl had to desperately climb over them as the streak of furious liquid followed her. Meanwhile, across the facility, the vicious, psychopathic old man was hungry for more. His mouth stretched into a wide, sadistic grin, and he continued walking further into the base. He would find new victims. He would feel their fear and drink in their dying screams. Several mobile task forces were dispatched from other nearby containment facilities. They'd likely reach the embattled site within the hour, but how many lives would be lost before then? The death count was already well into the double digits. After all this running, the young girl was getting tired. It was rare that she needed to truly avoid and escape a threat like this, and as such, she wasn't exactly prepared for such a scenario. She found her way into a broom closet and locked herself inside, hiding among mops and brooms. She tried to quiet her breathing, holding a tiny hand over her mouth. Red flashes continued to occasionally illuminate the corners of the door. She breathed in and out, in and out. Was something waiting outside? The young girl gasped as water started bubbling underneath the door. It started looking around her feet, then rising up from the ground. To the young girl, it was astonishing. The water was forming the shape of a woman standing right in front of her. Her lower lip trembled with fear. For a moment, she was at a loss for words. Then she gulped dryly and began to speak in a soft little voice. I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you. I promise I was just thirsty. The water nymph tilted her head slightly, confused. Did this tiny child really mean this? Was it an honest mistake? After all the terrible things that had been done to her, the water nymph had difficulty trusting humans. But as the young girl started to cry for reasons she couldn't quite understand, the water nymph felt the urge to comfort her. Perhaps she wasn't with the Foundation. Perhaps this girl was just another prisoner. They were allies, not enemies. While the water nymph couldn't speak, as a show of solidarity, she began to transform. She got smaller, herself becoming a little girl made of water, almost mirroring SCP-053. She raised a hand and waved. The young girl giggled, seemingly put at ease. It'd been a long time since she met a new friend around here, and it seemed like the water nymph was ready to change that. Maybe they could escape this place together. The young girl opened the door and the two of them ran out together, passing through an adjacent hallway. The young girl ran while the water nymph slithered formlessly along behind her. They managed to sneak around and avoid detection from the many anomalies and Foundation guards duking it out for supremacy in the chaotic halls of the facility. In a sense, it provided the perfect cover for the unlikely duo to escape this bizarre situation, but they weren't out of the metaphorical woods yet. First, they were cornered by a trio of paranoid guards, all wielding handguns. However, the young girl's nightmarish ambient ability came in handy once more, 
The three men lost their minds and started killing each other, giving the young girl and the water nymph more time to escape and keep moving, though they were about to encounter the deadliest threat of all. The young girl took point, leading the water nymph down the nearest hallway, when suddenly, SCP-106, the old man, emerged from the wall right in front of her. He had such anomalous malice in him that the young girl's powers was effectively useless against him. He grinned and approached her, his arms extended, ready to ferry her off to the nightmare of his pocket dimension. The young girl had never felt so afraid, until suddenly, the water nymph slithered in between them, and she assumed her full humanoid form once more, forming a wall between the young girl and the old man. This turned out to be the perfect way to save the young girl's life. SCP-106 has historically found liquid barriers incredibly confusing, and it's been widely considered to be one of the few ways to effectively delay the old man's rampages. Seizing the moment, the young girl turned and ran away. The water nymph had just saved her life. Sadly for them, neither the water nymph nor the young girl escaped that day. The mobile task forces arrived and took control of the facility again, recontaining the various anomalies who had escaped, but even if they never saw each other again, the water nymph and the young girl would forever remember how they helped each other on that incredibly strange day. The young girl stood silently in a room full of corpses, staring off into the distance. She was in a trance, seemingly unaware of the carnage that had just unfolded around her. Some of the men were shot or stabbed or beaten. Others had no apparent cause of death whatsoever, but the young girl was unscathed. She was wearing a yellow summer dress and looked like she couldn't have been more than three years old. She awoke from her trance, still paying no heed to the violence in the room, and left. This is the story of SCP-053, the young girl. Her strange and terrifying life before containment, her thrilling capture, and the part she played in one of the most dangerous SCP Foundation cross-tests of all time. She had no name. The young girl could never spend enough time around someone to be given one. It was her terrible curse that she could never stay in one place for too long, or something truly awful would happen to everyone around her. She'd been drifting for years, but never grew to look older than a child. Her memories were long but formless, divided mostly into 10-minute increments. The young girl kept on moving. It was all she could do. In 1993, when the young girl had already been alive for a very long time, she found herself in Illinois after days of trekking on the roadside. She would scavenge what little food she needed from the trash and drink from lakes, rivers, or even puddles when she needed to. Deep down, the young girl knew that if she ever grew hungry or thirsty, she would not die. In her travels, the young girl had managed to scrounge together a few dollars, and though she knew her contact with people had to be limited, there was one thing she wanted that felt worth the risk. A candy bar. It had been a long time since she tasted chocolate, and she found the idea of tasting it again too enticing to resist. When she reached Chicago, she entered a small corner store with her handful of dollars, selected a candy bar from the rack, and approached the counter. For reasons even she didn't fully understand, she kept her eyes down as she placed the money on the counter. You see, SCP-053 was always a special child. As we briefly mentioned earlier, you might even say she was cursed. Whenever she was around other people for too long, terrible things tended to happen. Unspeakable things. And as a component of this strange, unexplainable curse, or perhaps as a means of keeping her safe from it, the young girl was doomed to never understand the nature of her predicament. It was like there was a mental wall between her and the horrors her presence could cause. All she knew was that it was best to avoid eye contact, stay away from large groups of people at all costs, and never spend any longer than 10 minutes around anyone, ever. That's why, as she waited for her chocolate bar at the cash register, she kept her head down and waited to go. The cashier looked upon this strange girl with apparent concern. It had been a slow day, all in all. A few listless patrons milled around the store, window shopping. His brain was practically on autopilot until he saw this child. She looked filthy, in a disheveled dress and was totally alone. 
What on earth had happened to this child? The more he looked at her, the more he sensed a creepy vibe exuding from her. Something about this girl was wrong. He spoke softly to her, introducing himself as Miles, and asking her where her mommy and daddy were. The young girl hesitated for just a few seconds too long for his liking, before simply saying that they were at home. Any parent who'd let their three-year-old kid just wander around the south side of Chicago alone was either crazy, neglectful, or both. He asked her politely to remain in the store while he gave the police a quick call. He'd even let her have the candy bar for free while she waited. Immediately, the little girl became uncomfortable. She had already been in here for a few minutes now, and while Miles called the police, he expected her to wait around even longer. Again, she couldn't even tell you why she knew waiting around like this would be so dangerous, but she had a nagging, instinctual awareness that she needed to get out. Around the store, the few patrons still inside started to get a strange feeling, like someone was watching them. Soon, what seemed like mild paranoia was quickly becoming white-hot anger. Pure rage. They felt almost like they had to kill someone, but not just anyone, someone particular. They had to kill the little girl. It wasn't long until the police arrived. Two officers, Holiday and DeWitt, entered to collect the apparently neglected little girl. It was a story they'd sadly heard all too often, a tragically common occurrence in the big city. When the two of them approached the young girl, she was looking down at the ground. They tried to speak to her, but she was unresponsive. Miles looked on, concerned, but deep down, he felt the same bizarre progression all the other storegoers were feeling. Confusion, irritability, and finally, violent rage. The corner store was a powder keg. All it needed now was a spark. And that spark came when Officer Holiday reached down and took the young girl by the arm. His bare skin touched hers, and it was all over. The cop twitched. His mind washed out in murderous insanity as he reached for his sidearm. Officer DeWitt opened his mouth to protest, but he didn't manage to get a syllable out before Holiday turned and shot him. In a fraction of a second, the quiet corner store exploded into a violent bloodbath as the patrons and cops slaughtered each other. All the while, the young girl just stood there in a trance. Everyone was dead within minutes, except Miles and the young girl. He shakily rose to his feet, his mind carved out by madness, and reached for Officer Holiday's discarded pistol. Outside of the store, the young girl appeared, walking out as if nothing had happened. Inside, Miles' body was sprawled over the counter, clutching his chest as if his heart had just exploded. This was the true nature of the young girl's curse. Anyone who meets her eye, touches her skin, or spends over 10 minutes around her is destined to slip into a state of murderous insanity. They'll go into a kill-crazy frenzy and attack anyone around them until all that is left is them and the young girl, at which point they'll try to kill her too. But the mere act of attempting to kill her is also fatal, killing its victims with a massive heart attack or a seizure. The second part of the girl's curse is that she herself can never die. She keeps coming back, unknowingly causing more misery and death along the way. Until, of course, a certain secret organization took notice. That night, the young girl sat in the cavernous interior of a local abandoned warehouse, quietly eating her hard-earned candy bar. Suddenly, she heard a quiet crack in the distance. She tried to move her left arm, but found it was numb. She could barely move it. The girl turned her head and saw a tranquilizer dart sticking out of her skin. Instinctively, she got up and began to run, limping as her left leg started to lose all feeling too. Suddenly, she was surrounded by footsteps, as masked men in SWAT uniforms emerged out of the darkness on all sides. The last thing she remembered before slipping out of consciousness was a blindfold being pulled over her eyes and tiny metal handcuffs clasping over her wrists. When she woke up, she was in the nicest room she had slept in in years. It was 16 feet by 16 feet, with toys, books, and games. Standing across the room from her was a stranger in a full hazmat suit, connected to a long steel cable leading out of the room. He spoke calmly and politely. A timer on his wrist counted down from 10 minutes. 
The stranger explained to the young girl that they would be taking care of her now and would provide her with all the toys and games and treats she wanted, provided she cooperated and submitted willingly to some tests. Compared to living out on the streets with no food or comfort, this seemed like an excellent compromise. She would live in what seemed like luxury, and every so often, she'd be taken to a testing room with a stranger in an orange jumpsuit. After a few minutes of waiting, the stranger would inevitably go feral and attempt to kill her, and then always die in the process. The strangers in the hazmat suits told her that all of these tests were helping them learn extremely valuable things about her, and that soon they'd have a very special job for her. It would be a wonderful surprise. It was the spring of 1994 that the young girl, now officially designated SCP-053, finally received her special mission. Several strangers in full hazmat suits, wielding rifles, escorted her out of her usual bedroom. She asked where she was being taken, and was told she was going to meet a new friend. She was taken to one of the recreational testing rooms and pushed inside. Out in front of her, she saw something terrifying. A giant reptilian creature. She retreated from it instinctually, hiding behind a chair in the containment area. The giant reptile didn't move. It just sat there. Eventually, she plucked up the courage to go and touch the creature before retreating again. No reaction. Little by little, the young girl gained confidence and continued to approach and pat the creature. It exhaled through its huge nostrils, and the young girl literally jumped for joy in her amusement. She began to play with the docile monster, hugging it, even drawing on it with a crayon. The observers were truly baffled. What the young girl didn't know was that she was playing with SCP-682, one of the most hateful and aggressive anomalies under the Foundation's watchful eye. And yet, in her presence, the creature was like an overgrown puppy dog. After the test phase, the young girl was removed from the hard-to-kill reptile's presence, immediately causing the creature to become violent and murderous once again. After being separated from her strange new friend, the young girl was seen crying for several minutes. According to all accounts, the young girl is eager to see her friend again someday, though considering the reptile killed several guards after their separation, the Foundation isn't eager to grant her that wish. SCP-053 was classified as Euclid and continues to be held in containment, with her toys, books, and games rotated out on a regular basis. Seeing as she shows no sign of aging, this ongoing containment is likely to be the sad, strange fate of the young girl, an anomaly that never wanted to hurt anyone, but an important and cruel reminder that what we want doesn't always influence the world in the way we want. Water, the wellspring of life. We've dealt with a number of anomalous water sources on this channel, like SCP-006, the much sought after fountain of youth, or the terrifying SCP-3280, where murderous water threatens to destroy the entire world. But we've never seen anomalous water that behaves quite like this before. In many of the legends of King Arthur, the Sword of Excalibur is presented to him by the mystical Lady of the Lake. This lady emerges from the depths of the water, gifting Arthur with the enchanted sword. It's an incredible, if impossible, image. A woman appearing from within the lake, rising up from the bottom and breaking through the surface. It's safe to say that none of us have ever seen anything quite like it. Well, at least most of us haven't. In a small unnamed English village, there was a young woman who set out on a particularly lovely warm spring day to take a swim in a nearby lake. While wading in the water enjoying the sunlight and the gentle breeze on her skin, she saw a strange ripple ghost across the surface. She stopped her swimming, staring at the motion. She expected to spot a fish or some other aquatic creature. Instead, the water itself began to rise up, gathering and forming into a shape before her eyes. It was impossible, and yet here it was, happening. She pinched herself and found that she was definitely awake, as the water transformed into the shape of a human woman. It turned to look at her, shimmering eyes finding hers and liquid lips forming into a warm, inviting smile. Though this being was shocking to see, it clearly meant her no harm. It raised a translucent arm and gave her a small wave, as if to welcome her to its home. 
The young woman approached this lady of the lake, reaching out her own hand of flesh and bone to touch this impossible creature. Just as her fingertips reached the water woman's own, the figure dissolved back into the lake with a splash. The young woman ran home, telling anyone who would listen about the incredible thing she had seen that day. Of course, no one believed her. That is, until word of her sighting reached the only people who might take her claim seriously. The SCP Foundation. They sent operatives to the lake, where they managed to capture the shape-shifting entity dwelling there. SCP-054, also known as the Water Nymph, is a being made up entirely of water, with an average volume of 90 liters. When it is out of a body of water, the being tends to adopt the appearance of a humanoid woman, though it is capable of taking on a variety of other shapes including other humanoids, animals, and various inanimate objects. The entity is also capable of shedding its form and effectively disappearing into a given body of water. In order to avoid shrinking or possibly disappearing entirely from evaporation, SCP-054 is required to return to a larger body of water. Studies of samples taken from the entity's body, or its version of a body, revealed that it is made up of ordinary water. There is no apparent reason for its ability to move, and no thermal, electromagnetic, biological, or supernatural anomalies were detected. The research team could not determine what might make this water alive and sentient, and the nature of its unusual properties is uncertain to this day. When SCP-054 was first brought into containment at Site-08, it displayed surprisingly congenial and curious behavior, often walking around outside of the water and taking turns mimicking the shapes of various staff and scientists that spoke to it. Its demeanor began to shift towards suspicion and aggression, however, following a series of experiments and an incident involving the research staff. The first experiment conducted on SCP-054 sought to determine what would happen if the entity was denied access to any fresh water. Water was drained from the fountain holding it, leaving only enough water for it to form a humanoid shape, but no additional water in the basin to compensate for the effects of evaporation over time. SCP-054 became visibly frustrated as the water was being drained out of its enclosure. For the next few days, it enthusiastically greeted anyone who entered its containment facility, attempting to use a report and sense of familiarity to convince the person to provide it with more water. After it realized that this approach had no impact on the amount of water in its fountain, it became distant and even cold to anyone who attempted to speak to it. 054 only became friendly again once the water in its fountain was restored to a pre-experiment level. Next, the research team opted to test SCP-054's reaction to extreme temperatures, particularly extreme cold. The temperature of the containment facility was slowly dropped until the room fell below the freezing point of water. As the temperature dropped, 054 became sluggish and exhausted. It lost its ability to shift between forms, remaining locked in its preferred humanoid female shape. Its movement slowed more and more as the room grew colder, until the entity was completely frozen solid. Portions of the ice were chipped off and studied, revealing the crystals were identical to those of ordinary ice. After the Sub-Zero testing, the research team decided to take things to the other end of the spectrum and test the effects of heat on SCP-054. The subject was placed in a tank outfitted with heating equipment, and its temperature was slowly raised over the course of several minutes. When the water reached a temperature of 95 degrees, the entity's behavior became frenetic and aggressive. It pounded on the glass walls of the tank and attempted to break through the lid in a desperate bid for escape until the temperature was returned to a comfortable level. After the extreme temperature experiments, the previous calm and cooperative nature of SCP-054 was nowhere to be found. The subject displayed increased suspicion of the research team and would fight back whenever it was removed from its fountain and taken to a lab for experimentation. In spite of this newfound resistance, the team decided to continue their experiments as planned, hoping that the entity would return to its formerly docile self over time. Next, Dr. Seskel, the acting head of the research team, conducted a study involving SCP-054's memory and ability to be conditioned. The entity was presented with a series of increasingly complex mazes and puzzles. When it failed to comply with the experiment or solved a puzzle incorrectly, the entity was punished with an electrical shock or the release of silica gel into its body. Both of these options seemed to cause it a great deal of pain and distress, and it was eager to avoid further exposure to them. SCP-054 displayed impressive learning and problem-solving capabilities, revealing it is likely much more intelligent than it was first presumed to be. 
Dr. Seskel, observing the experiments and with the effectiveness of his somewhat unsavory motivational techniques, quipped to his research assistant that they would have it trained to fetch in no time. After several days of these experiments and repeated use of both the silica gel and electrical shocks, the entity's progress slowed down considerably and it became visibly exhausted. It was removed from the lab for a 48-hour rest period before experimentation was resumed yet again. This time, Dr. Sesko planned to expose SCP-054's water source to various levels of acids and bases in order to test its homeostatic capabilities, beginning with a 0.5M solution of hydrochloric acid. Prior to conducting the experiment, Dr. Sesko noted, I have no idea what will happen, but if this thing incorporates homeostatic mechanisms like I suspect, then we should get some insight into how it maintains its form. He also noted that SCP-054's behavior was becoming increasingly erratic, but made the decision to continue with the experiment as planned. SCP-054 displayed a now familiar reluctance when it was removed from its containment chamber and taken to the lab. It thrashed around in the fountain, splashing researchers with water, and retreated from them as they approached. In spite of its efforts, however, it was removed from its fountain and placed in the experimental tank. The solution of hydrochloric acid was then dripped into the tank, and then all hell broke loose. As soon as the acid touched the surface of its water, SCP-054 became incredibly distressed. It formed into the shape of a human face, eyes wide, mouth open in a silent scream of rage and pain. The water churned so aggressively that the lid of the tank was shaken loose, allowing it to escape the boundaries of its containment. The water formed into two large hands, which shot out of the tank and grabbed the two nearest researchers, pulling them into the water and exposing their skin to the acid now present there. As the men scrambled to drag themselves back out of the tank and their colleagues were busy helping them, SCP-054 took on its usual humanoid form and ran for the door. It then collapsed into a puddle, slipped under the crack in the bottom of the door, and made its way down the hall. It was apprehended roughly ten minutes after its escape by a team of guards who froze it using canisters of liquid nitrogen and then carried its icy body back to the containment facility. The two researchers who had been pulled into the tank experienced chemical burns on their skin, as well as significant mental distress. They were given immediate medical attention and placed on a leave of absence, and all experimentation on SCP-054 was suspended until further notice. At the recommendation of Dr. Seskel, 054's object class was changed to Euclid. SCP-054 is currently contained in a watertight isolation room, fitted with climate control equipment. A beautiful, intricately designed fountain has been placed in the center of the containment room, filled with fresh spring water in order to accommodate the entity's environmental needs. All maintenance workers assigned to the area must wear NBC suits while inside, and must spend 10 minutes isolated in a drying room after exiting before they are permitted to return to the rest of the facility. If 054 breaches containment, the area must be evacuated, and the containment chamber will be filled with liquid nitrogen in order to freeze its water solid. As the entity is highly sensitive to the conditions of the water that houses it, chemical levels and volume of the water in the fountain must be monitored on a regular basis, and kept at optimal levels for the health of SCP-054. During the course of its containment following the incident around the Acid Base Incorporation experiment, 054 has developed a distrust of men, as the researchers handling that experiment were primarily male. In order to prevent future incidents and keep SCP-054 calm, no male staff are to be assigned to the team monitoring its containment unit. Because five years have passed since the last incident involving SCP-054, its object class has been changed from Euclid to SAFE on the recommendation of the lead researcher assigned to its case. Of course, caution should still be exercised while interacting with the entity. This is the SCP Foundation, after all. And just because a moderate amount of water is good for you, doesn't mean you can't still drown. Experimentation on SCP-054 has resumed, though this time its boundaries are being honored, and it is allowed adequate time to rest and recuperate between experiments. All use of punishment in order to motivate the entity has been suspended, as it has shown itself to be more than willing to cooperate if it is treated with respect. Like all of us, it responds far better to kindness than it does to fear and intimidation. It doesn't just take on the appearance of a person, it has thoughts, feelings, and the urge to defend itself when threatened. So think twice next time you find yourself swimming in a random body of water. You should be mindful of what might be living in there. Not just of the fish, the algae, and the tiny water bugs, 
but of the invisible, intelligent, impossible creatures that might be swimming in there with you or even make up the very water itself. It's an unusually calm moment in the SCP Foundation. No one is in the hall besides a scientist and a young female subject. There are no tests going on, just observation. The scientist calmly asks her questions as he escorts her down the hallway, hoping to get more insight into her unique abilities. So why does she look so utterly terrified? As the scientist tries to get her attention, the young woman becomes more preoccupied, staring nervously around the hallway. Does she fear the scientist? Why does she keep muttering strange phrases that don't make any sense? How did it break through such a heavy door? That door is nearly a foot thick. How did it manage to destroy it? The scientist is looking at his notes and tries to make sense of the young woman's statements when he notices something terrible. She's staring at one of the doors containing another highly dangerous SCP in top of the line restraints, but it's safely locked away, right? The scientist swears he can hear the sound of scratching behind the steel door. It was 17 hours later when the dangerous SCP broke out of its containment cell and could have laid waste to the entire SCP containment facility if it wasn't for the heavily armed response team waiting outside to contain it and return it to its cell. The huge loss of life was only avoided because the SCP Foundation had advance warning, all thanks to the greatest secret weapon the Foundation has ever seen, SCP-187. But the Foundation's most powerful defense against dangerous SCPs is probably its most unlikely, a completely normal-looking young woman in her early 20s, whose only distinguishing characteristic is how thin and haunted she looks. Despite being no danger to anyone in the Foundation, She's one of the most carefully guarded SCPs in the facility, to protect her from herself. SCP-187 is one of the most powerful precognitives ever found, but her abilities are a danger to her own mind. This average-looking girl has a unique telepathic ability where she can see into the future of whatever she's looking at, seeing it simultaneously in two frames of existence. She sees it as it is now, as well as what it will look like in the future. Say, for instance, she's looking at a baby tiger cub. Aw, cute. At the same time, she also sees the massive, fearsome jungle beast it'll become. She won't see minor changes to its state, so she won't be able to tell you how your next haircut will look. But if something drastic is about to happen to someone or something, she'll be able to predict it with perfect accuracy. There's only one problem. She can't turn it off. This involuntary ability goes off whenever she sees someone or something that's about to undergo a major change in its status. This means that at any time, she can be bombarded with horrible visuals, and that even includes food. Ever since her abilities kicked in, SCP-187 has been unable to eat normally because whatever she eats or drinks, she sees it in its future state. When she looks at a glass of water, she'll see it as a liquid but a little more yellow than it usually is. As for solid food, she'll see it as what it comes out as after it's been digested. Not exactly appetizing, so for a while it looked like she was likely to starve herself to death in the Foundation's custody. Fortunately, the administration scientists were able to find some workarounds around her ability. Feeding and hydrating her intravenously was an option, but further study of her abilities made clear that her power was processed through her eyes. That means that when she's blindfolded, she's able to eat without her precognition kicking in. Being assigned to the detail for SCP-187 is very different from most SCP details. If you're assigned to SCP-682, you're constantly worried that the horrible carnivorous beast with a hatred for all things human is going to get loose and tear you to shreds. Not so much with SCP-187. This duty is more like a medical team, where the patient is highly valuable to the institution and can't be allowed to get free or to harm themselves in any way. The Foundation has taken the highest precautions to ensure SCP-187 is safe, including a set of medical restraints that she's strapped into, except when out of her cell or participating in tests. Even when given more freedom, her hands are always in soft mittens, to keep her from trying to damage her own eyes as a way to neutralize her powers. Her team blindfolds her before every mealtime and feeds her with some mild sedatives added to her food to keep her calm. Through consistent care, she's starting to recover from her self-induced starvation. The personnel chosen for this assignment are carefully screened before being sent in to interact with her. 
They need to be the most responsible and detail-oriented members of the staff, who won't miss a thing when it comes to her care routine. Just because 187 is harmless doesn't mean she can't move fast, and one misstep could cost the Foundation their most valuable asset. And unlike most SCPs, 187 is rarely handled by D-Class personnel. They don't have access to higher security specimens, and they don't have the training due to their short tenure. But there's another reason the Foundation keeps 187 away from the lowest men on the totem pole. D-Class personnel are frequently used to test out dangerous SCPs, and are lucky if they get to end their service intact. When she was exposed to some D-Class personnel early in her stay, she saw them as horribly bloated, with holes in their heads, or missing half their body. Those unfortunate personnel soon met horrible fates, sucked out into the vacuum of space, shot while trying to escape, and bitten in half by an escaping anomalous creature. Additionally, while most D-Class personnel are amnesticized after their service, some are terminated for breaking protocol or trying to escape. SCP-187 would see any of these unfortunate personnel walking around as the corpses they'd wind up as. The Foundation wants to learn the full extent of her powers, though, and this means tests. Lots of tests. When she first came into the Foundation's care, they were focused on figuring out how her power worked. They gave her IQ tests, and she got every answer right on the written test. Her IQ was measured as being off the charts, at least 300, which would make her the smartest person alive. But her normal behavior didn't seem to match up with this level of superintelligence. Confusing them even more, when she was given a computerized IQ test, she scored slightly below average, with a score of 97. The scientists assigned to her case studied the results and created other tests, until they understood how her precognitive ability works. She can see the future of anything that's physically affected, so when an answer is marked down on a piece of paper, that's a notable change. But when an entry is typed into a computer, the computer remains the same, so her ability wasn't able to help her on the computerized tests. But her abilities could still help the Foundation especially when it comes to improving security for other anomalies. She had inadvertently prevented the escape of an especially deadly SCP creature by predicting it would break through the door. But how would her powers manifest in more complicated cases? Some Foundation researchers postulated that she might be able to see into the future of deadly, indestructible anomalies like SCP-682 and figure out a way to eliminate it. But temporal experts warned this could create a paradox. After all, she would be looking at an elimination protocol that didn't exist until she looked at it. But her powers and how they might help in other ways other than neutralization warranted further exploration. So personnel were assigned, and the SCP-187 experiments began. SCP-162 is a horrible mass of fishhooks, wire, and other sharp implements. It exudes a psychological pull, and any unfortunate person who touches it winds up being pulled in by the barbed objects and absorbed into its mass. SCP-187 was kept at a safe distance and examined it, and was undisturbed. She saw it only as a pile of melted slag, indicating that it would be neutralized at some point. SCP-529 a normal and friendly cat, except for the fact that its back half appears to be completely missing. The cat acts as if it's whole, and when SCP-187 was exposed to it, she didn't seem to notice anything wrong with the cat. She played with it briefly and seemed to be calmer than any other time she was examined. The Foundation is considering using SCP-529 as a motivating tool after she requested to revisit it. Other tasks had much more disturbing results as SCP-187 discovered things about subjects that researchers were previously unaware of. SCP-003, a strange organic circuit board made of hair and nails attached to a stone tablet, appears to be an ancient machine. But when SCP-187 was introduced to it, she greeted it like a person and had a conversation with it as the staff looked on confused. When she was interviewed after, she described the entity as a very nice lady. What is SCP-003 evolving into? The Foundation is studying it closely thanks to SCP-187's advanced warning. When exposed to SCP-015, a massive network of pipes that seems to be slowly growing and defends itself from any attempts to work on it with tools, SCP-187 observed few differences from its current state until she opened a door. Inside, she reported a massive network of pipes reaching for miles with no end in sight. 
SCP-015 had been reduced to a manageable site and its danger had been contained. But SCP-187 indicated that it may be getting ready for its biggest and most dangerous expansion yet. SCP-415 a seemingly normal human man with an ability to regenerate his internal organs, has been a subject of the Foundation's investigation since his arrival, particularly due to the strange physical alterations he underwent to make it easier to access his organs. He's one of the more peaceful SCPs at the Foundation, but as soon as SCP-187 was exposed to him, she became disturbed. She begged to be removed from the room, and upon interrogation revealed that she saw SCP-415 as a deceased corpse. What is going to happen to the seemingly immortal man? SCP-187 was also exposed to some of the more dangerous SCPs in the Foundation, including SCP-173, a seemingly living statue that moves in unpredictable ways whenever it isn't observed, and has been responsible for the deaths of many D-Class personnel who enter its enclosure for cleaning. But it seems to be stable in containment, so why, when exposed to it, did SCP-187 begin screaming immediately? have to be removed from the enclosure and fall into a catatonic state for two days. She remembered nothing from the vision she had of the statue, and it took days for her to recover fully. The Foundation is keeping a close eye on the statue, even closer than they were before. SCP-106, also known as the Old Man, a depraved killer resembling an elderly rotting corpse, is known for its frequent escapes and sadistic attacks on anyone near it. When exposed to SCP-187, the observation lasted less than a minute before the old man attempted to escape. SCP-187 looked to be in direct danger from the old man, but he never touched her or harmed her in any way. When she was interviewed after, she explained that the old man wanted an audience, someone to watch it. The incident was recorded as a close call, and an indication that some of the other entities may have their own plans for SCP-187. SCP-187's power works without fail, and that tempts many people to try to use her to get answers to important questions. But they should be careful what they wish for, as one doctor found out during an examination. SCP-187 looked at the woman's hand and observed that it was odd that she wasn't wearing her wedding ring. But the doctor was, and had been for the last 19 years. But the next day, her husband filed for divorce and SCP-187's prophecies proved, once again, correct. So what are the future plans for SCP-187? The Foundation is being careful with her abilities, both to preserve her sanity and to prevent any potential time paradoxes. A routine has been established to keep her safe, fed, and protected from some of the worst effects of her ability. But the experiments using her visions aren't going to stop anytime soon. Many of her visions predicted dangerous new evolutions in Keter class anomalies, giving the team time to prepare and up security measures. No one knows where SCP-187 came from, or what the source of her unique abilities is. But while the SCP Foundation is keeping some of the most dangerous entities in the world safely locked away, their most valuable asset may be one of the most harmless. Because as long as SCP-187 has her visions, the next breakout or apocalyptic event can be stopped in its tracks before it happens. Does life imitate art, or does art imitate life? It's a question that has been asked throughout human history. This philosophical debate is about the ways art either reflects the world around us or influences it. But in the case of SCP-085, the idea of art imitating life takes on a far more literal meaning. This entity was created during an experiment involving two separate SCPs. The first of these was SCP-067, which is a fountain pen that, when held by a user, will take full control of the person's hand and arm. SCP-067 then either writes about or draws something linked to the user holding it. The second of these SCPs was SCP-914, better known as the Clockworks. This massive piece of anomalous machinery will have various effects depending on what or who is placed inside of it, and which of its several settings is chosen on the selection panel. After test subject 1101F was given the anomalous fountain pen, the result on the page was a simple female figure, around 6 inches tall and 1.5 inches wide. She was drawn wearing a summer dress with her long hair tied back in a ponytail, and a single word was written underneath her, Cassandra. 
As part of the experiment, the drawing was placed inside of SCP-914 and the find setting selected. This is the setting that is known to improve the object placed inside of it in some way. For example, a hunk of steel placed inside will be transformed into a pile of steel carpet tacks, a refined version of the steel. When the drawing was placed inside, something truly amazing happened. Cassandra came to life or as she now prefers to be called, Cassie. SCP-085, sometimes known as Hand-Drawn Cassie, is a completely sentient being. She is fully able to communicate, however it all has to be done non-verbally. Her voice cannot be heard by anyone beyond the page where she was drawn, but she is able to utilize sign language or create writings on the page in order to communicate with Foundation researchers. SCP-085 has been shown to also be capable of understanding text that is written on the same paper she exists on. She is fully animated, aware of her own existence and the limitations of being two-dimensional in nature. According to profiling conducted by the SCP Foundation, she has her own distinct personality. Cassie is good-natured and agreeable, displaying a natural drive and motivation, but also seems to feel the burden of loneliness, living in solitude on the page. It should be noted that any and all attempts to recreate the same experiment that formed SCP-085 had failed to create the same or similar results. Tragically, Cassie might be the only one of her kind in existence. A creation of pure luck with no chance of making another. No wonder she feels so lonely. While Cassie is limited to her two-dimensional form and has so far been unable to enter our three-dimensional world, she has demonstrated several different abilities on the page. Firstly, she is not solely confined to the same paper she was drawn on. SCP-085 is able to transfer herself from sheet to sheet. If another page is placed flush with hers, she will be able to simply step across onto this new page. However, there is a limit to what kind of page Cassie is able to transfer herself onto. She could easily take a stroll through the pages of today's newspaper, but can't just wander onto someone's family photos or anything made of cardboard, glass, or parchment for that matter. SCP-085 can only exist on paper or canvas, and only when they are directly connected to her original page. According to Foundation testing, this is not exclusive to blank pieces of paper either. If Cassie ever transfers herself onto a page bearing a repeated pattern, like a piece of wallpaper, then she will appear to be in the foreground while everything else on the paper appears to be behind her. SCP-085 will perceive each page she enters as a completely new place. From her point of view, pattern pages seem to be like endless space. Additionally, Cassie can also travel to other pieces of artwork and adopt the same art style of each new environment she appears in. For example, transferring herself onto the pages of a comic book will cause Cassie to be rendered in an artistic manner matching that of her surroundings. The same occurs if she travels to an oil painting, watercolor, or charcoal sketch. Interestingly, when appearing in comic book form, Cassie's thoughts and speech are visible through thought bubbles that are commonly used to display text within the comic medium. Her size and the angle she is viewed from also changes to match the different panels of the comic page she is on. At one point, SCP-085 was introduced by Foundation personnel to a print copy of Ascending and Descending by the famous Dutch artist M.C. Escher. This painting is of a large building, with its roof consisting of a looped, never-ending staircase. When she transferred onto the print of Escher's painting, SCP-085 curiously explored her new environment and was able to ascend and descend the staircase. The researcher gave Cassie the name of the piece and asked for her thoughts on it. She remarked, it's pretty, I guess, would make a neat exercise track. When the researcher asked if she noticed anything inconsistent about the staircase, Cassie replied, no, as far as I can tell, it just loops around, down, up, all the time. Why don't more staircases do that? It's pretty neat. Following this, Cassie directly requested more impossible objects or optical illusions to be drawn onto her page and made part of her environment. Unfortunately, her request is still pending review from the O5 Council. Being able to step from page to page, transferring herself onto canvas or sheets of paper is but one of SCP-085's unique abilities. She can also interact with other drawn objects on the same page she is on. If someone draws an item of clothing on her page, or a vehicle, even food or drink, then Cassie would be able to wear, use, or consume those. Objects drawn for her behave as if they were real, but only when Cassie is directly interacting with them. 
The rest of the time, they remain still, just as they were drawn. Once SCP-085 touches them, these items will animate. This same rule even applies to anything drawn to depict something in motion, for example trees being blown in the wind or the waves of an ocean. These will also stay perfectly still when drawn and only move when acted upon by SCP-085. However, much like her ability to transfer from page to page, Cassie's power over other two-dimensional drawings has limits. Drawing anything that would normally be an inanimate object within the real world will provide SCP-085 something that she can directly interact with, but this doesn't appear to be the case for living beings, like another person or an animal that would have its own autonomy and freedom of movement in our three-dimensional reality. Animals and people drawn for Cassie to interact with will remain as static, unmoving drawings and will not become animated like she is, even if drawn using SCP-067. She cannot impart any of her own sentience or free will onto these drawings, and they remain still even when she touches them. You might think that drawings of other people, whether they are animated or not, might help alleviate Cassie's solitude, but if anything, it just reminds her how alone she is. SCP Foundation researchers have noted that SCP-085 is very friendly towards them and any subjects brought in to conduct experiments with her. Visits from the three-dimensional world outside the page she inhabits seems to offer some relief to Cassie's loneliness. Through much of her behavior, she has shown a fascination with our reality, and in particular she has an interest in cars, expressing that she wishes she had an ability to work on them. This desire appears to be completely genuine too, as shown when her photo was taken with SCP-978, the camera that reveals its subject's inner desires and in Cassie's case, showed her in a fully realized 3D version of herself working on a car. SCP-085's curiosity about the world beyond the page is most likely due to how different it is from her everyday two-dimensional existence. But on at least one occasion, Cassie's curiosity got the better of her and unintentionally led to a containment breach. From the moment she was first drawn to life, and even after her initial testing with researchers, SCP-085 seemed unaware that she was a two-dimensional being in a three-dimensional world. Foundation security protocols regarding SCP-085 meant that no one on the research team assigned to Cassie was permitted to tell her the truth about her 2D nature. The truth about her existence was kept from her with the best of intentions, as research staff did not want to cause SCP-085 any undue distress or trigger a possible psychological snap. Anything that Cassie raised as an inconsistency or discrepancy within her world on the page was explained by researchers to be the result of her imagination or dreams, and research personnel attempted to convince SCP-085 that she was in a scenario wherein she was the only human survivor, searching for others in a post-apocalyptic environment. However misguided this decision to conceal the truth might have been, it was at least done with Cassie's best interests at heart. But a lie, as they say, is harder to maintain than the truth, and keeping SCP-085 in the dark about her true nature arguably led her to more hardship that may have been avoided if she had been allowed to know the truth. In the incident in question, a Foundation researcher entered the room where the drawing pad that Cassie resides in was found, and they were carrying a paper copy of SCP-085's Special Containment Procedures report. Given that she had already partaken in tests where she had transferred herself to other paper and canvas surfaces, Cassie assumed that this file was yet another new environment for her to explore. The researcher allowed SCP-085 to make direct contact with the report, and she was able to transfer over to the document before the researcher realized their mistake. Whether this occurred accidentally or if this researcher intended to confront Cassie with the truth about what she was is unknown. Nevertheless, Cassie found herself on the pages of her own SCP Foundation file. The record of every test the research staff had conducted, a full description of how she had first been drawn by SCP-067 and brought to life by SCP-914, all clear as day, in black and white. Cassie's own true nature was presented to her. Immediately, the yarns that Foundation researchers had spun about her surviving an apocalypse began to unravel. It was all a lie meant to keep her in the dark and prevent her from ever knowing that she was trapped in two dimensions. She returned to her original page shortly later, but the damage was already done. Due to her having breached containment and briefly escaped into her own file, a number of Foundation researchers proposed that SCP-085 be destroyed. There was always a risk of this happening again, 
What would happen if Cassie unwittingly found herself inside another file, with access to more of the Foundation's sensitive information? However, the O5 Council decreed that SCP-085 was not to be terminated, allowing Cassie to continue to exist despite the breach. Ever since she learned the truth about herself, signs of depression have begun to manifest in her behavior. Finding out you are a drawing trapped in two dimensions with no chance of ever having someone else for company would be enough to crush anyone's spirit. But luckily, researchers have since managed to uplift Cassie a little and offer her a welcome distraction from her unfortunate revelation. The optical illusions like the never-ending staircase she requested were quickly drawn into her environment. Additionally, given the interest she had shown in a technical drawing of a 1964 Ford Mustang convertible, SCP-085 had been allowed to assemble a car of her own. By transferring each individual component of the car from the blueprint to her page, hand-drawn Cassie had been gradually building her very own Mustang to keep herself preoccupied from her life in cartoon motion. And in the end, if she can distract herself and find that tiny bit of happiness, isn't that all that matters? In a sense, we're all trapped within our own dimension. Cassie in her 2D1, us in our 3D world, filling our lives with hobbies and entertainment, all in an effort to make sure that we never tug too hard at the threads of our reality and find out there just might be much more out there that we're missing. The SCP Foundation has a reputation for cold, inhumane conditions. But being contained as an anomalous human doesn't mean your stay inside a secure facility has to be as bad as it might seem at first. Of course, more dangerous anomalous entities, such as SCP-076, codenamed Abel, are locked away in a containment chamber outfitted with maximum security precautions and guarded by the Foundation's most well-trained and heavily armed personnel. But not every anomaly poses a danger and the Foundation realizes that. Sure, the monsters like SCP-106 or SCP-096, who need no introduction, aren't exactly treated to a bed and breakfast every morning, but those lower on the danger scale can get pretty comfortable inside their new home, depending on how well they're behaved and how little of a threat they pose, of course. Take for instance SCP-076's less violent brother, SCP-073, also known as Kane. SCP-073 is peaceful, a complete contrast to SCP-076's destructive fits of violent and rage, and as a result, he's treated like nearly any other low-threat anomalous humanoid. Amenities, clothes, maybe even some time in the Foundation's recreational spaces if they're extra well-behaved. It's true that the Foundation has been doing a lot for the anomalies it contains, especially in recent years. After all, anomalies contained by the Foundation are, containment breaches aside, supposed to be contained for life. The least the Foundation can do with all of their seemingly infinite money and funding is show them an easier time while they're in there. Sometimes anomalous humanoids are integrated into the Foundation's command structure, such as the case with the mysterious Dr. Clef a former Global Occult Coalition agent turned Foundation operative with reality-bending powers and a penchant for neutralizing dangerous anomalies. Or Dr. Jack Bright, who continued to work as a Foundation researcher following an accident with SCP-963, an amulet that made his consciousness immortal. Or Kane Pathos Crow, once an ordinary Foundation scientist, now a golden retriever blessed with superintelligence, thanks to an experiment gone wrong. Or Wright, depending on who you ask. It is true, the Foundation is definitely more accepting of the anomalous than it may initially seem. Let's take a look at a particularly notable anomaly contained by the Foundation. SCP-166 can be seen as a baseline example of how the Foundation treats the average humanoid anomaly that doesn't pose a significant threat to the organization or society at large. SCP-166 is contained at the famous Site-19, inside a hermetically sealed antechamber outfitted with an industrial air purifier. Personnel assigned to SCP-166's containment chamber must wear specially designated biohazard suits before entering, and keep them on at all times, lest they succumb to SCP-166's anomalous effects. SCP-166 is a teenage girl of European descent, possessing certain bodily features found on a reindeer. She has antlers, hooved feet, and a short tail. All that's missing is a red nose, right? But despite looking like one of Santa's most trusted four-legged helpers, SCP-166 has little to do with the animal. In fact, scans of her DNA reveal no irregular genetic traits. To the instruments used to record such things, 
She is a completely ordinary human. Her reindeer features are, according to some Foundation theorists, a reflection of her connection with nature and a remnant of her past. But we'll get to that. Aside from her fluffy parts, what makes SCP-166 so anomalous? As it turns out, SCP-166 possesses an incredibly strong anomalous ability. Any artificial objects, meaning those that are man-made, within a 15-meter radius of SCP-166 will return to an unworked state. For example, a car placed within SCP-166's range will return to a composite of paint, metals, leather, and plastics over time. These higher complexity objects, such as vehicles or electronics, are affected more quickly by SCP-166, with degradation of their metallic components giving out and causing massive structural failure, resulting in an unusable object. More natural objects made of rudimentary materials, such as stone buildings and products made of organic materials, will decay at a much slower, nearly imperceptible rate. So SCP-166 containment chamber and containment solution is more than safe, though it might need to be repaired and touched up over the years. SCP-166 is very in touch with nature as her appearance would suggest. In fact, in areas where objects degraded as a result of her influence, flowers and plant growth will begin to appear. Sometimes this foliage will grow in places that should otherwise be impossible for it to, such as ID scanners or security cameras. You could imagine that the inside of the chamber is practically a botanical garden. Still, the Foundation has to be careful with how SCP-166's containment chamber is constructed and who enters it, as the degrading deer girl harbors a particular sensitivity to artificial materials and pollutants, such as smoke or pesticides. Inhalation of or contact with one of these airy substances causes SCP-166 to grow ulcers and suffer symptoms of asthma attacks. Even being in close proximity with a smoker can cause SCP-166 pain, with one instance prompting a severe asthma attack despite the Foundation doctor in question having not smoked a cigarette in over three weeks. If you need another reason to stay away from smoking, do it for SCP-166. Isn't she adorable? You wouldn't want to give her a panic attack, would you? Not only are SCP-166's visitors limited and screened beforehand, but her clothing consists of organic cloth so as not to trigger a degradation effect. All of her meals must be prepared by a trained Foundation chef and followed according to a specific set of guidelines, with as little inorganic additives as possible. The Foundation has to be a bit more careful than usual with the items requested by SCP-166. Not only due to her anomalous ability to degrade objects, but due to her mysterious past and connection with a small convent of nuns in Ireland. We'll explain. You see, like most humanoid anomalies, the Foundation has allowed SCP-166 to put in requests for personal items she might find missing from her containment. Now, the Foundation may deny these items for a variety of reasons, but there's also a chance they won't. To date, SCP-166 has requested a copy of the Holy Bible, a Catholic Rosary, and various books and magazines involving religious content, all of which were approved by Site-19's director, Sophia Light. SCP-166 also requested access to a Catholic priest for confession, mass, and other sacraments. This request was initially denied, but later reapproved after Chaplain Davis, an ordained member of the clergy working with the Foundation, agreed to meet with SCP-166 on a bi-weekly schedule, every other Sunday. SCP-166 also requested a telephone, which she intended to use to contact the Abbess of Our Lady of Mercy Convent, a cloistered society of nuns in County Galway, Ireland. This request was a little more complicated to process. At first, it was denied, then granted, and then denied again after a reconsideration by Director Light. But why did SCP-166 want this item? What connection could the dear girl have to a group of nuns in Ireland? The answers lie in the Foundation's discovery of SCP-166. SCP-166 was discovered in the Our Lady of Mercy convent in County Galway, Ireland where the girl had been living since infancy. Her strange appearance and abilities initially made her the subject of scrutiny by the sisters who lived there, but she was taken care of and raised as a member of the Catholic faith. When the Foundation was alerted to SCP-166's existence, a defecting global occult coalition agent operating under the codename Ukulele, who is now in the process of joining the Foundation, confirmed that he recognized SCP-166. 
He knew that SCP-166 was the child of an incredibly dangerous entity, classified by the Global Occult Coalition as Threat Entity 9927 Black, a being codenamed the Goddess. The Goddess also was being pursued by the SCP Foundation and given a designation as an SCP object, though its number and the exact details of the file have been redacted by the Foundation for security purposes. What we do know is that the Goddess was a seriously dangerous entity, and both parties were dedicating as many resources as possible to its capture, containment, or neutralization. The conflict between the Goddess, the Global Occult Coalition, and the SCP Foundation came to a head during an event known as the Cornwall Incident. The Goddess's file, which was received and archived by the SCP Foundation, has a portion describing SCP-166, which reads as follows. Threat Entity is the child of incarnated LTE-9927 Black, the Goddess, and an unknown father. While it strongly resembles its mother and shares its animalistic features, it lacks the extreme bestial appearance of 9927 Black, possesses minor chlorokinetic abilities, but primary reason for Threat Entity classification is the instinctive knowledge knowledge and eligibility to enact occult procedure Clockwork Black Child Havila, a worldwide ritual working that would irreversibly regress human civilization to Neolithic standards. Strike Team Lancelot neutralized 9927 Black in England during an operation which would later be known as the infamous Cornwall Incident, but were unable to confirm the liquidation of 9927 Black Child due to the death of the strike leader, Agent Ukulele. Ukulele was posthumously awarded the Silver Aegis for his lifelong service to humanity. As the file stated, SCP-166 is the child of the goddess, and the reason for her anomalous degradation abilities is so that she can enact them on the world and fulfill her mother's unholy mission, a ritual that would regress society to prehistoric times, ridding the world of modern technology and man-made creations. Why the goddess wanted to carry out this ritual is unknown, but SCP-166 was her key to achieving her primitive desires. Through her child, she could reach her goals, but the Cornwall incident threw a wrench in the goddess's plans. Agent Ukulele, a global occult agent famous for decommissioning dangerous anomalies, was tasked with killing SCP-166. Perhaps it was her human appearance, or the fact that she was only a small child, or even something that lay even deeper. Ukulele could not bring himself to terminate SCP-166. He defected from the Global Occult Coalition, faking his death and taking SCP-166 alongside him. Entrusting her care to the Convent of Nuns, Ukulele made himself scarce, relieved that SCP-166 was safe. After being free from the Global Occult Coalition's grasp, Ukulele was unsure of what to do with his life. Taking the name Alto Clef, Ukulele had rid his previous identity from the anomalous world and was prepared to start a new life. But he couldn't let SCP-166 live unattended. What if the Global Cult Coalition found her and terminated her in an act that would finish what they had started all those years ago? What if the Foundation discovered her? He didn't want to risk the girl being put into a life of containment that she never wanted. Clef decided that he made the best decision and kept SCP-166's existence to himself as best he could. But his hand was forced not long after. SCP-166 at the age of 12 was seen by a civilian visiting the convent, who reported her existence to the authorities. The Foundation became aware of SCP-166. Clef, wanting the best for SCP-166, exchanged valuable Global Occult Coalition intelligence, documents, and information with the Foundation in exchange for SCP-166's containment and guaranteed safety. It was the best he could do for the girl. Clef then fully defected to the SCP Foundation, where his skills were heavily in demand. Soon, SCP-166 was retrieved from the convent and brought into containment. At least now, Clef could know she was safe. The Cornwall incident resulted in the termination of the goddess, and all parties were relieved that the world was rid of this dangerous and mysterious entity. But it also brought Clef a significant amount of strife. Why did he save SCP-166? Why was the battle-hardened and brutal assassin unable to kill her? What connection did Clef share with the goddess, if any? SCP-166 often wondered about the exact details of her past. She wasn't privy to her history with Clef or all the details of her birth, or what arcane rituals she was born to carry out. SCP-166 only knew the convent, her faith in the Catholic religion, and her life in the custody of the SCP Foundation. 
During her talks with Chaplain Davis, she often discussed these feelings and desires to know more about herself and her past. The Foundation kept further details about the goddess and her past under restrictive classifications, and attempts to pry deeper never bore SCP-166 any fruit. One conversation between SCP-166 and Chaplain Davis was particularly noteworthy. Inside the small confessional, where the two met every other week, they exchanged greetings and began talking. SCP-166 enjoyed her talks with Chaplain Davis, which allowed her to explore her faith and further her appreciation of it. It also gave her an opportunity to talk about her feelings and thoughts in an environment similar to the ones she was raised in. To start, Davis reminded SCP-166 that information she gave him could be reported higher up in the Foundation, if need be. In the Catholic religion, confession is a confidential space, but for the SCP Foundation, the rules of the church are often broken. As usual, I have to remind you that due to our environment, the seal of confession will not take place unless specifically invoked. Even then, details of our conversation can be unsealed if they're determined to be essential. Understand? Davis said. SCP-166 understood and nodded her head. First, SCP-166 asked a question about a replacement for Pope Benedict, who announced his retirement at the time of the interview. Chaplain Davis responded, Ah, yes, that was rather unfortunate. But it does make sense, my child. He was rather old even when he first took up the position. Now he can rest, knowing he served the church well. SCP-166 was curious to know if a replacement had been decided. Davis informed her that while there was speculation, one had yet to be decided for certain, though he was sure the church would want to go forward with a fresh, new face to broaden its mission. SCP-166 seemed pleased at this, but Chaplain Davis sensed an underlying discomfort in the girl. She wasn't speaking her true feelings. He assured her that whatever questions she had, he could answer to the best of his abilities and without any judgment. SCP-166 decided to speak up. She wanted to know if Chaplain Davis had a good relationship with his parents. Davis sat back for a moment and thought carefully about his response, as he did with all questions that could cause an emotional response in SCP-166. No topic was more sensitive for SCP-166 than the matter of her heritage. Davis informed her that he maintained a good relationship with his mother before she passed away, and a less than happy relationship with his father. Davis asked SCP-166 about her parents diverting the conversation away from himself. He wasn't sure at this point exactly how much SCP-166 was told or knew. In fact, the Foundation didn't even let Chaplain Davis know the full context of SCP-166's origins. I never really knew my parents, said SCP-166. I got dropped off when I was a baby. I mean, I, I guess they must have known the sisters if they put me there, but I don't remember them. Just what I picked up. They mentioned my mother a bit before they realized they should watch what they say about me. I think they said something about her being a goddess, which obviously wouldn't be true. She must have been some sort of spirit, but she must have been something if I ended up looking like this. I remember eavesdropping on the abbess. She was talking to one of the other sisters about how she had done something wrong, something about a ritual that someone else stopped. They said she died. Davis, taken aback by SCP-166's revelations, told the girl that he was sorry for her loss. SCP-166 said that it wasn't like she knew her anyway, so she wasn't bothered by it all that much. Davis asked about her father, but SCP-166 also had little information on him. She said that she had asked the abbess about him multiple times, but she never mentioned SCP-166's father. She wondered if her mother, the goddess, was so horrible. What did her father do that made him unspeakable? SCP-166's questions would not go unanswered. One day, a letter was found inside her containment area. It read, I first met your mother when we were little more than children. She had hooves for feet and starlight in her eyes. She was beauty and nature incarnate, and I killed her with my own two hands. Eden isn't a place. It is a state of being. They wanted to take us back to it, and I stopped them. I took paradise away from us for a second time. I have never regretted my actions on that day except one. And when you first met me on that day, you saw your father put a bullet into the head of your mother. I make no excuses, only explanation. You may not have even remembered it, but I'm telling you now in the hope you understand why I did what I did. I hope you forgive me. I love you. I wish I could have done more for you. The best I could do was leave you in the hands of kind and loving people and hope they would raise you in my place. From what I've seen, they did well. 
I'm sorry you couldn't stay with them. I'm sorry they brought you to this place. I promise to do my best to make sure your stay here is pleasant. I promise to keep you safe. Happy 16th birthday from your loving father, Dr. Clef. Site-19's director, Sophia Light, gave Clef a disciplinary interview for making unapproved contact with SCP-166 and writing such an emotional appeal to the girl. Clef had been barred from talking to SCP-166, and his superiors were even skeptical about letting him work at the same site as her. Light showed sympathy for Clef's dilemma. For 16 years, SCP-166, Clef's daughter, was unable to live her life normally because of who she was. He felt partially responsible. Despite being one of the Foundation's most trusted and powerful agents, capable of sending a strike team anywhere in the world and knowing secrets people would pay billions to know, Clef was unable to talk to his own daughter. In the end, Clef was subject to a minor disciplinary infraction, but the hope that he may one day reunite with his beloved SCP-166 remains. It all started in 1983, with reports of human trafficking in the heart of Sin City. The FBI had gotten word of a potential trafficking ring operating out of an abandoned department store in Las Vegas, Nevada, and immediately began organizing a secret raid on the building. While they would indeed encounter something horrifying within that abandoned department store, it wasn't criminals or human trafficking. In fact, it wasn't human at all. This is the horrifying story of SCP-847. After weeks of planning, the raid on the department store was conducted in the dead of night. Agents covered all the exits and entrances, and a helicopter was stationed nearby in case anyone attempted to run. It should have been a perfect trap, but things never go as planned when you don't know what you're dealing with. The agents breached the door and began searching the darkened building. It didn't appear that there was any power, so the traffickers must have had great night vision and a high tolerance for creepy locales. Agents soon heard a faint humming sound coming from below, a generator. It must be located in the basement and be the hub of this criminal enterprise. Readying themselves for whatever they were about to find, the agents descended into the basement. As they moved deeper into the building, they found that lighting rigs had been set up. They must be getting closer to something, but that something was still a mystery. A senior FBI special agent was leading the charge, his pistol drawn and ready. It was quiet too quiet. Did the traffickers already realize they were coming and clear out? He was ready to consider this bust a bust when he heard a quiet mewling in the distance, a persistent whining whimper that was undeniably human. He gave the signal to his fellow agents to follow the noise. They proceeded forward towards the pain sounds and found themselves in a wide, well-lit room filled with department store mannequins. All were broken to some degree. Some were totally smashed to pieces. Some were chained to walls and locked in cages. Others were wrapped in plastic. The agent wondered whether this was some kind of twisted joke or a messed up avant-garde art piece. That's when he noticed her, a single crouch figure in the distance, hunched over and whimpering in a darkened corner of the room near a full-length mirror. He couldn't fully make her out, but he got the sense that something was wrong. She was injured, bent over. Was she even missing an arm? Just what have these monsters done to this woman? He whispered a request for backup into his radio and pushed on. When he got within 50 meters of this strange woman, her demeanor changed entirely. She jerked around, her movements forced, erratic, and painful looking. The woman stared directly into the agent's eyes and began hobbling towards him, occasionally stopping to strike a pose as if modeling during a photo shoot. Just then, the agent made a horrifying realization. This thing moving towards them wasn't a woman at all. It was a living mannequin. As she got closer though, he realized that the mannequin's broken left forearm had been carved into a large shiv. A female junior FBI agent had been one of the many to pour into the room when the raid leader had radioed for backup. The second she entered the 50 meter range of this strange mannequin, everything changed. In an instant, its eyes and mouth began dripping with a thick, viscous resin. Its whimpering gasps suddenly became vicious, ear-splitting screeches, and it turned its gaze from the senior FBI agent. It was now focused on the junior agent, who had just entered the room and broke into a terrifying run straight towards her. The mannequin moved with a violent, single-minded purpose. Other agents began firing, but it was running freakishly fast and easily dodged most of the bullets. The few that actually hit seemed to do nothing to slow the creature down. 
It shrugged off the damage and kept running. With a great leap, it landed on the terrified junior agent and began jabbing her with its bladed arm. The other agents stopped firing, fearing they might accidentally hit their colleague during the panic. The mannequin was ruthless, clawing and stabbing with the strange resin leaking out of its every orifice. Terrified and unable to reach her gun, the agent remembered her training. She reached into her belt and grabbed her stun gun, jamming the two probes up against the creature's chest and giving it 30,000 volts. The creature spasmed, fell backwards, and collapsed in a heap on the ground, frozen. This was the first recorded encounter with SCP-847, a violent living mannequin with a serious problem with women. This terrifying report was passed up the chain of command until it landed on the desk of a Foundation agent working in the FBI. The Foundation quickly swooped in and claimed the mannequin, delivered necessary amnestic treatment to all who'd witnessed it, and closely observed the female junior FBI agent's recovery in a private hospital with Foundation ties. As it turns out, they were right to do so, as the junior agent was in for a gruesome fate. While the wound she'd suffered at the hands of SCP-847 didn't appear fatal, the fact that the mannequin's anomalous resin excretions entered the open wound changed everything. Several hours after being committed, the junior agent began complaining of limb stiffness and difficulty moving. This quickly developed into full paralysis. Over time, her skin and internal organs began to harden, until the process dubbed plastination came to a gruesome end. The junior agent wasn't just dead, she had been transformed into a mannequin. Foundation researchers were met with a truly horrifying realization. This means that all the other broken mannequins found with SCP-847 were likely once living humans, attacked and transformed by the anomaly, now a source for new harvested body parts. Now safely interred at a Foundation containment facility, though, the real tests on SCP-847 to determine its behavior and physical attributes could begin. The most important detail about SCP-847 is that its aggression is exclusively directed towards women, as opposed to when it encounters men, and its instincts are more self-destructive. Through a series of tests and observations, researchers have been able to pin down three different distinct patterns of behavior for SCP-847. Pattern Z behaviors occur when there are no humans standing within 50 meters of SCP-847. The mannequin will seek out a full-length mirror and pose in front of it, much like a department store mannequin attempting to show off its clothes. It remains largely inanimate during these periods and will very occasionally use a finger or whatever appendage is available, given its habit for self-mutilation, to scratch messages on nearby surfaces. Pattern Y behavior occurs when male humans with XY chromosomes enter a 50-meter radius around SCP-847. Just like its reaction to the male FBI agents who found it, 847 will initially emit vocalizations that seem like whimpering gasps, before making eye contact and striking provocative poses while approaching the subject. It will then remain static and allow the male subject to pose its body. However, after the male subject leaves the area, 847 will enter a state of considerable distress and begin removing or shattering parts of its body. The Foundation has found that the parts removed or shattered are often consistent with parts that the male subjects found displeasing during interactions, showing a masochistic desire to impress. These parts are then harvested back from plastinated victims, which brings us to the most dangerous of its behavior patterns. Pattern X behaviors occur when female humans enter a 50-meter radius around the creature. 847 will immediately become brutally aggressive, switching its noises from whimpers to violent screeches and growls. 847 experiences enhanced physical capabilities during Pattern X states. Its speed has been measured at 45 kilometers per hour, making it as fast as the legendary SCP-096. It's also been shown to exhibit extreme physical strength. It's during this pattern of behavior that it begins excreting its deadly resin, which has been proven to only be dangerous to women. In these states, the only thing capable of reliably pacifying the being is a powerful electric shock. The shock causes the creature's resin to harden, temporarily incapacitating it for roughly five minutes. 
other conventional weapons and damage has no meaningful effect on SCP-847. After a number of incidents that had sad and violent endings, the Foundation Ethics Committee forbade the use of female D-Class personnel in SCP-847 testing. When it came to female subjects, 847 always slipped into a state of extreme aggression, so instead the Foundation began testing with male subjects in hopes of better understanding the dynamics between human males and SCP-847. Various misogynistic D-Class males were introduced into the containment chamber, which was modeled to look like a bedroom for the purposes of behavioral study. Each one, either during or after their interaction with SCP-847, was told to comment on some aspect they felt dissatisfied with. The mannequin shattered its own chest after hearing it described as being out of proportion. After another D-Class called its nose ugly, the mannequin broke it off. After another said that its hair was out of fashion and commented on its inability to drink, it tore out its hair and liver. All parts were replaced after the experiments. Things took their most violent and upsetting turn yet with the introduction of D-7294. A lot of the time D-Class personnel are considered to be as anonymous as they are expendable, but D-7294 is an exception. Before becoming D-Class, he was a successful cello teacher who brutally murdered one of his teenage students and her mother. He's typically employed in tests when the Foundation wishes to see interactions between anomalies and humans with confirmed psychopathic personalities. During his interaction with SCP-847, he belittled and humiliated the mannequin. He forced it into uncomfortable poses and even snapped off one of its fingers before being dragged from the room by Foundation guards. In the following debrief, he further berated the mannequin as useless and lousy at its job of being controlled by him. In response, 847 extracted its own brains, eyes, and clavicle before shattering its own hands in dismay. So why does 847 behave this way? While it may appear monstrous, it seems that the reason SCP-847 does what it does is all too human. It hurts women because it itself is hurting, and it's willing to hurt itself even more for the approval of the objects of its desire. As a result, it's an anomaly trapped in an endless cycle of pain and violence. Perhaps one day, it'll be able to free itself from the loop, but that day is unlikely to come for this murderous mannequin anytime soon. Dr. Bethany Moore was exhausted. She'd been pulling an all-nighter to digitize some old files about SCP-2317, the door to another world, and she could feel herself nodding off little by little as the night drew on. For Dr. Moore, it'd been a whole week of long days. Something even worse when you work at a job as stressful as being a researcher for the SCP Foundation, and the exertion was starting to catch up with her. At around 2.30 a.m., she sighed, rolled back her office chair, and decided to take a quick break to grab a coffee and refuel. If she didn't get some pretty hardcore caffeine in her over the next few minutes, she was absolutely going to pass out on her keyboard. The fact that the rooms in the facility were kept at a relatively low light at this time of night to save power really wasn't helping her fatigue. Dr. Moore dragged herself down to the break room, too tired and too focused on her work to notice that things were eerily quiet. She was punching in her order for the largest espresso available when she noticed the quiet sound of footsteps approaching her from behind, slow, methodical, and unsettling, especially at this kind of hour. She turned and felt an immense relief wash over her. It was just Security Officer Chuck Walker, one of the regular guards at this site. Dr. Moore and Security Officer Walker weren't exactly best friends, but they'd cross paths on the job on numerous occasions, and they'd always been polite, friendly, and cordial any time they'd directly interacted. Hey, Chuck, she said while her coffee began to pour into the less-than-environmentally-friendly styrofoam cup behind her. Long night. Working hard or hardly working, huh? Security Officer Walker didn't respond. It was only now that Dr. Moore seemed to register just how dark the break room was. Really, the only source of light was the soft glow coming from the coffee machine itself. But light or no light, she could see something was wrong with Walker. His eyes seemed oddly distant, like he wasn't even looking at her. He was looking through her, off into some unknown place. Dr. Moore cleared her throat. Everything okay, Chuck? Before she could even finish her sentence, Chuck's hands were clasped around her throat. 
The movement was so sudden and violent. Her back was shoved up against the coffee machine, spilling the espresso everywhere. She tried to scream, but she couldn't get enough air. Chuck squeezed. His grip was like an iron around her thin neck. She silently gasped and spluttered as he choked her, still maintaining that glassy, almost dead look in his eye. Like doing this meant absolutely nothing to him. As things started to go dark, Dr. Moore's thoughts were naturally along the lines of, why is he doing this to me? And that's exactly when she got her answer. There were two eyes that seemed almost to be floating in the darkness behind security officer Walker, staring with equal indifference at this sudden and awful display of meaningless violence. She could only just make out the slender shape of the creature's mostly obsidian body, with the occasional patch of white. It was her. It all made sense now. It all made so much sense. The daughter of Snap. Dr. Moore's neck broke leaving her last thought forever unfinished. Security officer Walker loosened his grip, allowing Dr. Moore's body to slump to the ground. He turned to his mistress for approval, but she didn't say a word. She just left the room, and he obediently followed. This was the very first casualty of a containment breach that would go on to claim the lives of 43 members of SCP Foundation personnel. Several male members of the staff experienced what can only be described as a descent into violent insanity, turning on fellow members of personnel and committing murder, largely through the act of strangulation. A female mobile task force was brought in to deal with this rapidly escalating situation. The brainwashed staff members were relatively easy to neutralize, given the superior training of the MTF compared to on-site staff. But the being that did this to them would be a considerably more challenging foe. SCP-029, the daughter of Shadows, an extremely violent and dangerous Keter-class anomaly. She was still loose on the site, and that meant nobody was safe. The MTF prowled the hallways in three-person squads, while another small detachment headed to the maintenance and security rooms. They couldn't rely on the on-site guards for any help on this one, considering half the brainwashed murderers they just terminated had formerly been site guards. One of the squads finally encountered SCP-029 in a dark hallway and engaged her in violent combat. The Daughter of Shadows is an incredibly formidable opponent. She's significantly stronger than a non-anomalous human being. She's highly resistant to most forms of damage, and her reflexes are around four times faster than some of the fastest recorded non-anomalous human reflexes. In other words, she can shrug off bullets and seems to be one of the world's most proficient stranglers. You really don't want to have to engage with SCP-029 in a physical fight. One of the three MTF operatives attempting to subdue SCP-029 was already dead. Her neck practically caved in from the force of a squeeze when the lights finally came back on. While the Foundation didn't know a great deal about the Daughter of Shadows, they were aware of one thing. Her anomalous powers were significantly weakened when faced with bright light. The operatives in the maintenance and security rooms had turned up the lights in the hallway to their maximum brightness, stunning the Daughter of Shadows just long enough for the mobile task force to converge and, through their combined strength and resources, subdue and contain the creature again. She was swiftly delivered back to her high-security containment chamber and locked away once more. The containment chamber is sealed with a triple airlock, and powerful floodlights on the walls keep the creature in a constant state of stark illumination. A truly foolish mistake by Security Officer Walker, who'd been shot to death not even an hour prior by the Mobile Task Force, had caused this particularly deadly containment breach. Ignoring very specific Foundation containment protocols out of his own sense of foolish, morbid curiosity, he'd strayed too close to SCP-029's containment chamber and been dragged into her terrible thrall. Considering the vast array of potential world or even universe enders on the SCP Foundation's roster, SCP-029 is far from the most dangerous anomaly out there, but she's proven time and time again to be one of the most problematic to contain. And due to her incredibly violent temperament and dangerous anomalous abilities, every time SCP-029 does breach containment, a lot of innocent Foundation employees are bound to die. The Daughter of Shadows, a self-given name that seems to be inspired by the fact her skin pigmentation is 80% true black, has a seemingly unquenchable bloodlust. Though ironically, she despises the actual shedding of blood. SCP-029 has been shown to be capable of improvising a weapon out of almost any object. Truly the MacGyver of murder, 
but she will always kill in a manner that causes no blood to be spilled, hence her preference for strangulation. She also has the ability to brainwash male victims into committing murder on her behalf by making them believe that she is some form of goddess. Despite showing clear sentience and sound tactical reasoning, it's impossible to reason with the Daughter of Shadows, as she has no compassion or better judgment to appeal to. Her requests for a bed, a blanket, some books, and some clothes have all been denied, due to the pretty justifiable belief that all these requests are just a pretense to get security lowered around her. This harsh treatment actually led to an official complaint by Dr. Erica Brodine. It stated, This is ridiculous. The girl can't even have clothes. We are not animals. Let her cover herself. Dr. Sophia Light posted an official reply saying, Dr. Bodine, you are granted permission to deliver clothes to SCP-029. Life sadly punished Dr. Bodine for her compassion. The Daughter of Shadows murdered her with the very clothes she brought in to keep it warm and the tape of her grisly death is now used as an educational tool for anyone assigned to SCP-029. A grim reminder of the real and present danger that the creature poses to anyone in its vicinity. Because of the nature of the anomaly and her abilities, the Foundation takes a very hands-off approach to interacting with her. Guards are posted outside, and not even food is brought into the chamber, as SCP-029 seems to be able to survive just fine without it. At this point, you're probably wondering, what is this thing really? And how did the SCP Foundation find it in the first place? We'll tell you all we can about that. But be warned, SCP-029 is also linked to one of the darkest things the Foundation has ever needed to do in the pursuit of keeping an anomaly contained. It all began with what seemed like an incredibly random assault on Agent Ramachandran, an SCP Foundation field operative stationed in rural India. The assailant attempted to strangle Agent Ramachandran before being quickly subdued. Because of the strangeness of the event, the agent began a weeks-long investigation into who the man was and why he'd commit this attack. That sent Agent Ramachandran down a frightening rabbit hole towards a small but incredibly violent local cult. The men claimed to be Thuggies, a historically frightening group of roving robbers and murderers who terrorized parts of India throughout its long history. And what's more, this particular sect of thugs seemed to worship the Daughter of Shadows as a kind of earthbound demigod. They believed that if they made one million sacrifices to the violence-loving entity, it would bring about the end of the world. However, they also believed that only sacrifices committed via strangulation would count towards their million soul total. The Foundation amassed a small invasion force to infiltrate and take down their mountainside fortress from within. Naturally, they were met with considerable violent resistance, which sadly caused the death of Agent Ramachandran, the very reason we were able to locate the Daughter of Shadows in the first place. But in the end, the Foundation prevailed. The Thuggies were either slaughtered or repelled, and the Foundation operatives discovered SCP-029 within the temple, along with a huge number of corpses believed to be the cult's prior victims. Given how dark it was inside the temple, the Daughter of Shadows was a formidable level of power. She killed and brainwashed several of the agents who attempted to contain her, but was eventually subdued and transported back to the nearest secure containment site. One of the most infamous incidents that SCP-029 is associated with happened around seven years after her capture. The level of dark pigmentation on her skin was beginning to increase, prompting concern among researchers. When they asked her what was happening, she simply said that her followers were on the move again, prompting concern that 029's thuggy cult was due for another resurgence. Knowing how dangerous this cult could be, the SCP Foundation decided that drastic action would be needed to deal with them this time. When they eventually located members of the cult, they began tracking them and gathering intelligence. They discovered that a mass gathering of the entire cult was imminent on a day that they believed to be holy. The Foundation waited until then to strike. When the cult was gathered in worship, the Foundation conducted an aerial strike, killing them all in an instant. The second this happened, the Daughter of Shadows sat bolt upright and screamed for several hours, mourning the death of her beloved followers. She learned a hard lesson that day. While she and her methods were undeniably brutal, when the situation called for it, the SCP Foundation could be plenty brutal as well. Since this incident, SCP-029 has increased her efforts to escape, perhaps so she can get the jump on building a brand new cult.
The SCP Foundation faces off against a number of incomprehensible, impossibly dangerous threats every single day. They've gotten so used to containing terrifying monsters and world-ending anomalies that it's really just all in a day's work for them. But what if there was something that scared even the most jaded Foundation personnel? Something that none of them could track, understand, or even see. In the 1990s, employees of the SCP Foundation began to disappear without a trace. At first, the higher-ups assumed it was traumatized personnel making a break for it after they'd seen something that finally made them snap. But that wouldn't account for all the blood. At the sight of every disappearance, the last place anyone saw the missing person before they were gone, there was a massive amount of blood left behind. Not an I cut my thumb while chopping onions amount of blood, but an I'm missing a limb amount of blood. Buckets and buckets of what was confirmed to be the missing person's blood were found, spilled all over the scene of their disappearance. The first recorded instance of this phenomenon was captured via security footage of a laboratory late at night. There, Dr. Porter was sat in his lab chair finishing up some tests, running potentially anomalous soil samples through a variety of machines. The room was mostly dark, save for the light of a small desk lamp. Suddenly, he looked up from his work, eyes darting around the room. He couldn't see anything, but he could feel it. There was something in there with him. He couldn't shake the feeling that something horrible was about to happen, and not about to stick around and see what it would be. He made a break for the door. Just before his outstretched arm reached the handle, he jerked back into the room as if pulled back by his hair. He looked around wildly for his assailant, but there was nothing there that he could see. The security footage showed him jerked around, thrashing his arms as he tried to fight off an invisible attacker for several seconds. Then, he was gone, and the pristine white tile of the laboratory was smeared with that telltale bright red. He wasn't pulled into a pocket dimension like an attack by SCP-106. He was simply there one moment, and gone the next the blood on the ground the only sign he had ever been there at all. Dr. Porter's disappearance was troubling, but the Foundation hoped it might just be an isolated incident. Of course, nothing ever goes the way you'd hope when you're dealing with SCPs, and within the next six months, three more personnel had vanished in the same way. The phenomenon, whatever was causing it, had a few simple rules it seemed to play by. It occurred on a cycle of one to three months. It only happened to Foundation personnel, and it always happened in a dark place where visibility was limited. Understandably unsettled, many personnel stopped coming into work, afraid they might be next. Unfortunately for them, the phenomenon was not limited to the area within the Foundation's walls. It could find them, no matter how far they ran, as soon as they were in the dark. You can't fight, outrun, or outsmart the setting sun or your bedside lamp going dead. Research assistant Sanchez vanished while taking a shortcut down an alley at night. Dr. Costanza was taken while she was reading a book before bed. Her bloodstained sheets, discovered days later, indicated that she didn't even have time to run. Junior researcher Wantabe disappeared from the back row of a midnight screening of Evil Dead 2. Moviegoers at the same screening reported hearing some commotion from the back, like someone hitting one of the seats and kicking their legs. But they assumed it was just a massive Bruce Campbell fan excited about the movie. The noise only lasted for a few seconds anyway. And so the pattern continued. And every couple of months, one member of the Foundation staff vanished, leaving behind only blood and a sense of dread. None of the missing staff, dead or alive, were ever found. The phenomenon was assigned the designation SCP-835-JP, and though they tried to come up with a plan to contain it or put a stop to it, many accepted it as simply another occupational hazard in an increasingly long list that came with doing the Foundation's work. Just when it was beginning to look like there would never be a way to prevent new brushes with SCP-835 short of never being alone in the dark ever again, something weird and wonderful happened. In a Japanese SCP Foundation facility, during one of the phenomenon's inactive periods, a booklet entitled Artist's Impression of SCP-835-JP was found on the desk of a research assistant. It depicted a fictional character known as Ketaru Yamiko, intended to be a personification of the phenomenon. Ketaru Yamiko, as depicted in the booklet, is a young woman drawn in a traditional anime and manga art style. She is pale, with blue eyes and long black hair. 
and is dressed in a classic Japanese school uniform. In addition to her design, the booklet also describes the character's abilities and backstory. Ketaru is described as a type of assassin, with expertise in predatory ambush. A Santoku knife is her weapon of choice. She also displays anomalous abilities with regard to the absence of light. She is able to manipulate darkness and use dark and shadows as a weapon that she can trap her targets with. She is also able to teleport using shadows, transporting herself, objects, or her prey through shadows to remove all evidence of what she has done. The origins of Ketaru's abilities are somewhat murky, but whether she was born with them or given them, she came into her unusual talents at a young age. Due to her abilities, she was found by a mysterious organization, an unknown enemy of the SCP <laughs> Foundation, and abducted by them as a child. There they indoctrinated her and trained her to be a master assassin, teaching her how to use her abilities, master hand-to-hand -hand combat, and the use of weapons, and to have the ice-cold demeanor of a perfect killer. She learned to move in the shadows and make her darkness her ultimate home and ally. Once her training was complete, Ketaru was sent out into the world with one mission, to take out members of the SCP Foundation by any means necessary. According to the lore of the booklet, her killings drew the attention of the Foundation, though they did not understand who she was or who had sent her. Then they assigned her the designation of SCP-835-JP. The booklet was sent to the site's head researcher, who brought in the assistant for further questioning. The man confessed to have drawn the booklet, saying that drawing Keteru Yamiko had made him feel less afraid of the mysterious entity. By turning it into a fictional character, he was taking his sense of control back as well as turning his fear into a chance to explore his favorite hobby, drawing. What had once been a completely unknown entity, something without a face or a motive of any kind, was now a classic anime character and something he could wrap his mind around. Also, he just thought it all looked really cool. He was reprimanded for drawing on the job and making light of a phenomenon that had taken so many of his colleagues. He was transferred to a different department, and the booklet was largely forgotten about. At least until one researcher, Dr. Sato, noticed something curious. After the discovery of the Ketaru Yamiko booklet, also known as Incident 835-JP, there were no disappearances for five months. Another disappearance finally occurred, but the pattern which had been so consistent before was disrupted for the first time in a decade. Dr. Sato noticed this delay, and though his colleagues mocked him for it, drew a connection between the longer inactive period and the discovery of the Ketaru Yamiko booklet. He quickly got to work and developed a proposal, Protocol Idol 835, which was approved by a head researcher desperate for some kind of solution and promptly put it into practice. Dr. Sato's theory behind the implementation of Protocol Idol was that, somehow, SCP-835-JP was connected to and influenced by the perceptions of the Foundation personnel. In fact, it had likely originated from their collective sense of anxiety and paranoia in the first place, acting as a tulpa, or a thought made real through intense concentration and belief. Therefore, he hypothesized that by changing the staff's perception of the phenomenon from something horrifying and unknowable to an approachable and even fun fictional character, they could somehow contain it and stop any further disappearances. The goal of Protocol Idol was to create a shared version of SCP-835-JP for all of the staff to focus on, stripping the entity of its original power. Since many staff had already seen the original Keteru Yamiko booklet, she was chosen to be the shared, agreed-upon description of SCP-835-JP. With all of that decided, the protocol was officially put into place. First, all of the documents and reports that referred to SCP-835-JP were edited to include details about Ketaru Yamiko, including descriptions of the character, repeated mentions of her name instead of the SCP's number, and various illustrations. In addition to changing the records, a publicity campaign was mounted to cement the idea of Ketaru Yamiko in the minds of all of the staff. Ketaru Yamiko's design was painted on various supplies, on the side of transport vans, on the doors to laboratories, and as murals on several walls throughout the facility. The booklet was copied and distributed around the facility as a piece of required reading. The original author of the booklet was brought back on board to design and head the creation of a variety of other reading materials, including fictional novels, manga, and short animated videos featuring Ketaru Yamiko as the main character. 
Mandatory watch parties were held for these short animations, and free snacks and drinks were provided in order to boost morale. Several employees began jokingly referring to these watch parties as SCP Foundation Anime Club. Through the efforts of the Idol Protocol, the image and knowledge of Keteru Yamiko spread throughout the Foundation and became the dominant perception of SCP-835-JP. Since the implementation of this protocol, there have been no disappearances in line with SCP-835-JP's pattern, and the project was declared a success. Dr. Sato included this note in SCP-835-JP's file. SCP-835-JP is probably a manifestation of the instinctive fear that something threatening oneself may be lurking in the darkness. But the imaginary monster we once feared has now been reduced to a cliched character with Protocol Idol 835. Ever since the implementation of Protocol Idol 835, SCP-835-JP is considered neutralized. Its classification has been downgraded from Keter to Safe. There have been talks about strengthening the entity's containment by expanding the protocol outside of the Foundation in order to prevent the possibility of containment breaches down the line that might be brought on by exposure to a major cognito hazard or in-house amnestics. A special team of illustrators, animators, and writers have been brought on to spearhead the protocol, creating additional comic books, posters, and even beginning the early stages of production on a feature-length animated film about SCP-835 and her various exploits, tentatively titled Keteru Yamiko, Shadow Girl. There have been no plans made yet for international distribution, but who knows? We might just see Keteru Yamiko on the big screen one of these days. She might just end up as the first ever SCP to become a mainstream celebrity. And until then, the Foundation could also disseminate knowledge about her through other means. Say, a fun little animated YouTube video. But what's the chance they'd ever pull a move like that, right? The SCP Foundation has dealt with plenty of things that no one could ever even imagine. Creatures and objects beyond anyone's wildest dreams. An evil old man that can walk through walls. An Ikea that never ends. A giant underwater eel that can erase your memories. And so much more. But sometimes the anomalies they discover seem to be plucked from a familiar nightmare. In Korea, shortly after the end of the Second World War, a team of SCP Foundation officers encountered something right out of a dark, twisted fairy tale. In the late 1940s, the 5th Squad of the Eastern Division of the SCP Foundation received a call to come to Busan, Korea, and investigate a potential anomaly involving several deaths. Three agents, referred to from now on as Agent 1, Agent 2, and Agent 3, were deployed to the region, where they first headed to the morgue to examine the bodies under the cover of reporters investigating the deaths. The nature of the wounds indicated an animal attack, an eyewitness account from an old woman who saw a fox-like creature eating one of her cows supported this hypothesis. Of course, the agents knew differently. Sure, it was something like an animal, but this culprit was no animal they had ever encountered. The three recounted stories of fox spirits, villainous tricksters, capable of changing their shape and oppressing all kinds of havoc on those unfortunate souls they targeted. While sweeping the area, the agents encountered a beautiful young woman sitting under a waterfall, combing her hair. She was dressed in a light robe, and her feet were bare. This, they noticed, gave her away. Instead of having human feet, she had paws covered in reddish fur. The agents assumed that this creature was inexperienced, unable to properly conceal herself. They believed they had the upper hand on her. They would soon see the error of their ways. The woman greeted the three men and invited them to have dinner at her nearby cottage. Believing themselves to be relatively safe, armed as they were, and with three people against one delicate, if inhuman, woman, they agreed. The fox woman ushered them to a lovely rustic cottage and sat them down at the dining table. She served them plum wine, rice pickled turnips, and meat. Everything was delicious, and feeling at ease, the agents decided to turn in for the night. This creature, though unusual, did not seem threatening. She had no reason to attack them, or so they thought. Agent 1 woke in the night to go to the bathroom and tiptoed out of the cottage to relieve himself behind a bush. There, he saw Agent 2 with the fox woman. Let's just say, they were getting to know each other intimately. Suddenly, in abrupt change of mood, she bit him. 
She tore the man's throat out with her teeth before he could scream, turning his cries to a wet, useless gurgle. Then she took her hand and plunged it into his belly, shredding the flesh with razor-sharp claws. He thrashed and tried to fight her off, but she shoved him to the ground and tore his stomach open, rooting around inside for something. When she found it, she stopped and gleefully tore out his liver. As the first agent looked on in horror, she lifted his colleague's liver and swallowed it whole in one single gulp. Not noticing her onlooker, she continued her vile work, peeling her victim's skin like an orange. The agent who witnessed the whole thing regained his ability to move, adrenaline flooding his veins, and ran back to the cottage in search of his remaining teammate. Agent 1 shook Agent 3 awake, babbling incoherently as he tried to explain what was going on, and the fact that they needed to leave, and they needed to leave now. To his shock, Agent 2 walked into the room, asking what all the noise was about. Agent 1 immediately noticed the man's glowing yellow eyes and made his next move without thinking. He pulled out his gun and fired. Agent 3 drew his weapon next, pointing it at 1 and yelling for him to put the weapon away. 1 tried to explain that this man was not their friend, but rather the fox in disguise, but he wouldn't listen. The fox grabbed 1, and 3 shot him in the upper arm. Agent 1 dropped to the ground, wailing in pain as the fox laughed in a high-pitched, devilish whine. Agent 1 scrambled away, crawling into the living room and slamming the rice paper screen door shut. There, laid out on the dining table, was another agent. They had seen this man at the base of the mountain only a few days ago, but now here he was, eyes wide and glassy, and skin flayed open. Then Agent 1 saw the remains of their dinner. In the bowls, there was the flesh of their fallen colleague. With it was not rice, but maggots crawling over the meat. Agent 1 was able to improvise a weapon, breaking off a portion of the wooden beam and stabbing the fox through the stomach as she lunged through the rice paper door. He made his way through the forest, running as fast as he could with his gunshot wound. He found his way to the bank of the river and attempted to cross. However, he was disoriented and afraid. It was pitch black outside, and he was nauseous from the pain. He slipped on the wet rocks and hit his head falling into the water. The rapids carried him away, pulling him downstream for half a mile before he was able to grab hold of an exposed branch. Agent 1 made his way back to his team's van, broke a window, and pulled a flamethrower from the back. He recalled legends about similar fox-like creatures mentioning an aversion to fire, and so he prepared to fight her off with as much as he could get. Just as he readied the flamethrower for use, the foxwoman emerged from the tree line. What happened next is unknown, lost from the official record. However, after several days, a retrieval team tracked down Agent 1 and rescued him, capturing the foxwoman in the process. He was taken to the hospital, where he remained with a serious infection for several days before he was discharged. Initially, the Foundation planned to terminate the creature. However, Agent 1 vehemently opposed that decision. He insisted that they should keep her alive. He also recommended the containment methods used to imprison her be adjusted. The agent promised that she would not be held by the chosen methods, and that the result of her inevitable escape would be devastating. In his official interview, he had this to say on the subject. Like I said, she's spiteful. Every little slight in her eyes she saves up. The only way she knows how to repay an insult is death. Chaining her to the wall like an animal. When she gets out, and she will get out, she's going to kill everyone who had the slightest thing to do with it. She won't settle for anything else. Much to the Foundation's surprise, Agent 1 visited the Foxwoman in her holding cell several times. The Foundation attempted to understand this concerning behavior, but Agent 1 refused to admit that there was something strange about it. His attachment to the Foxwoman had been attributed to Stockholm Syndrome, brought on as a result of several days in the woods spent as her captive. To this day, Agent 1 is the only person to survive that long alone with the creature that is now known as SCP-953. SCP-953 is a female red fox, weighing approximately 8 kilograms. Unlike an ordinary fox, her spine splits at the base into nine different tails. Previously referred to as a kitsune, the shape-shifting fox spirit of Japanese legend, it has since been discovered that she is actually a kumiho, a Korean fox spirit with similar qualities. SCP-953 is a polymorph, also known as a shapeshifter, though she retains some aspects of her fox-like appearance no matter what form she is in, including ears, paws, tails, eyes, and fur. Though she attempts to cover these revealing physical traits with clothes and hairstyling, 
she is unable to get rid of them entirely. In addition to her shapeshifting, 953 has potent psychic abilities, including the powers of suggestion and telepathy. She has used these abilities to wreak havoc on her victims, causing them to experience terrifying hallucinations, hurt themselves, and in one particularly horrific case, convincing a mother to kill, cook, and eat her own child. She has also successfully used these abilities to escape containment six times. SCP-953's most recent escape caused the deaths of 10 Foundation staff. After destroying nearby security cameras, she shifted into the appearance of an adult man, walking out the front door in a stolen lab coat. Anyone who stopped her to ask for identification was swiftly slaughtered. After her escape, the fox disappeared for five years until she resurfaced at Yifcon, a convention for furries and anthropomorphic animal enthusiasts. There, the fox-like ears and tail that might draw attention in other places allowed her to hide in plain sight. The Foundation was alerted to her presence when a terrified hotel housekeeper called 911 after walking in on SCP-953 slicing open the torso of a dead convention-goer. By the time the Foundation reached the convention center and captured the fox, she had left two dozen corpses in her wake. The bodies, all mutilated almost beyond recognition, were found scattered throughout the hotel in various places, including stuffed into a mattress, hanging over a shower curtain rod, rolled up in a carpet, and strewn across a banquet table. The survivors were given Class A amnestics to wipe their memories and released from custody. The convention was cut short, with a dangerous gas leak as the cover story. So far, the Fox has not escaped Foundation custody again. SCP-953 is kept in a Type 4 containment cell in Hallway 99 of Site 17. She is provided 1.5 kilograms of fresh liver every day to eat as well as clean drinking water and a futon with blankets and sheets that are changed out weekly. In exchange for good behavior, she is provided the occasional luxury item such as plum wine, novels, or a variety of Korean sweets. After so many successful escapes, the Foundation realized that simple physical containment was not adequate to keep SCP-953 away from the general population. Making use of her fear of dogs, the Foundation keeps 953's containment chamber surrounded by dog kennels filled with Korean Jindo and American Foxhounds. All staff assigned to SCP-953's containment chamber are to be given background checks, looking for any prior ties to the furry community. Such affiliations may make them vulnerable to SCP-953's influence and have been attributed to the death of one Agent Gallagher. Because of her psychic abilities, no direct contact with 953 is allowed. All communication with the fox must take place from a distance of 100 meters, and food, water, and other items are delivered to her via a robotic assistant. She must be considered armed and dangerous at all times, and can only be transported while accompanied by six members of armed personnel. There are folklore-based procedures in place for employees as well, providing specific instructions to staff assigned to SCP-953. No matter how odd or ridiculous these instructions may seem, the staff is to adhere to them and remember that what we may think of as classic fairy tales are often more like ancient special containment procedures. If versions of the Kuniho and the Kitsune exist, then who knows what other seemingly mythical creatures the SCP Foundation might encounter in the future? What other beasts are lurking on the edges of civilization? hiding in the shadows, or worse, hiding in plain sight, just under our noses. Best to brush up on your local folklore, just in case. And as always, be careful out there. Robert Orlean and his partner in crime, John Streep, zip through the murky waters of the Louisiana Bayou on a speedboat. These men were dealers in the illicit, but their specialty was not any kind of contraband you'd probably recognize. Orlean and Streep dealt in rare orchids, illegally poached from areas where they're considered endangered and sold to high-paying rare plant collectors. As any seller or collector knows, rarity is the hallmark of value, and what these two men would encounter in the swamp that day was truly one of a kind. The problem for this pair of greedy opportunists is that only one of them would live to tell the tale. And thanks to the SCP Foundation, the other wouldn't remember it for long. That's what happens when you have a dangerous run-in with a certain mean green swamp-dwelling creature that doesn't take kindly to unwanted visitors. And no, we're not talking about a crocodile. Orlean and Streep continued through the swamp, keeping their keen eyes out for the flash of light blue that'd give away the orchids they were seeking. 
Little did they know, from the murky darkness between the reeds, a pair of big yellow eyes were watching them back. They were intruders in a stranger's land. Threats, just like the bad man. They would need to be dealt with accordingly, or a grim history would repeat itself. The boat came to a halt as the two poachers finally saw one of the rare flowers they were looking for arising out of the muck. Orlean leaped from the boat and began wading towards his prize. The flower would fetch him and his partner a pretty penny if they could get it back in good condition. The motions were so well practiced for Orlean, so automatic, that he didn't even notice something was moving through the waters towards him. Gators and snakes were an occupational hazard for people like Orlean. He kept a revolver holstered just below his shoulder as a precaution, but the thing about to kill him was unlike anything he'd ever faced before. Just as his careful fingers curled around the orchid's stem, Orlean heard Streep screaming from the boat. He was frantically pointing at something just beyond Orlean, emerging from the reeds. Orlean turned and felt his jaw falling open in horror at the sight of it. At first it seemed almost like a waterlogged corpse. Thick, matted black hair, heavy with grease and muddy bog water, teeming with parasitic swamp life. Her skin was green and bumpy, like that of a toad dripping with viscous green sweat that seemed like it could only be the byproduct of rot. But those eyes, those big yellow amphibian eyes, they were alive as they were inhuman. This creature wasn't a corpse, it was something else entirely. Her body cleared the water, standing at Orlean's height now and facing him eye to eye. She was naked, her dignity preserved by her long tangle of hair. Her body was human-shaped, except for her freakishly long, thin limbs. Her belly appeared visibly bloated or engorged, like a woman in the mid-stages of pregnancy. Orlean had never smelled something so foul in his entire life, which was mostly spent wading through swamps and bogs. She smelled like death itself. Streep was screaming for Orlean to climb back into the boat, but Orlean knew it was already too late. He reached for his holstered pistol, but before he could clear leather, the creature let out a horrific guttural hawking noise and spewed a stream of black goo onto Orlean's face. It was hot, sticky, and foul-tasting, like a kind of tar rendered from corpses. It plastered his open mouth and nose shut and began to suffocate him. He tried desperately to claw at his face and tear the offending substance away, but all that succeeded in doing was getting his fingers stuck. While Orlean suffocated and Streep screamed terrified obscenities from the boat, the creature just watched and smiled through rotten teeth. It was nice to see them panic, just like the bad man who'd come before. They were in the wrong. They deserved this. Orlean soon realized that nothing he could do would save himself. He'd spent his life in a dangerous profession and been lucky until now. But the Reaper catches up with everyone eventually. The last thing he saw as the world went black was this creature, this swamp woman, wading towards him through the water with a hungry look in her eye. She grabbed him on either side of his face and just held him there. What was that sound? Was it fizzling, like something was burning or even melting? She just kept staring and smiling with those awful rotten teeth. Robert Orlean went to sleep in her hands and never woke up. Back on the boat, a desperate John Streep was watching a scene that, if it wasn't for the later intervention of the SCP Foundation, would haunt him until his dying day. He watched his partner undergo a process that was somewhere between rotting and melting. He withered away in the swamp woman's hands, degrading into thick black sludge that she drank through her thirsty skin. As much as it pained him to leave his friend behind, Streep knew that there was no saving him now. All he could possibly do was escape with his own life. He pulled the ripcord on the boat's motor and tore his way back to the nearest township the shape of the nightmarish swamp woman shrinking in the distance behind him. When he ran into the local police station, half mad with grief and fear, screaming about the monster that had killed his friend in the swamp, the police understandably detained him for further questioning. When his criminal history as a poacher was flagged up on the database, 
it became clear he probably wasn't leaving for a while. That's when a Foundation agent embedded in the department passed a memo about the case's strangeness up the chain of command, and a covert mobile task force was soon dispatched to the swamp in order to locate and capture the anomalous creature that Streep had claimed took his friend's life. After a few days of searching, the Swamp Woman was captured by the Foundation and redesignated as SCP-811, before being delivered back to a nearby containment site. Luckily for Foundation disinformation agents, the cover story was practically gift wrap for them on this one. It had been a dispute between two hardcore criminals, and as the saying goes, there's no honor among thieves. Streep had murdered Orlean over a pay cut dispute and thrown him into the swamp where his body was eaten by gators. A few falsified records and implanted memories later, and the Foundation was free to do what it pleased with SCP-811. But the Swamp Woman would prove to be full of surprises and contradictions. While designated as Euclid, the containment procedures for the creature were rather extensive for its own benefit. Like a lot of creatures who'd never existed in captivity before, it had very specific needs in terms of its artificial habitat. The foundation needed to be on top of everything, from the pH levels of its soil acidity to the optimal temperatures and humidity levels of its containment chamber, built to resemble the creature's natural swamp habitat. The Swamp Woman is mostly non-aggressive to foundation staff, but certain precautions need to be taken in order to ensure everyone's safety around her. While she's largely humanoid, her internal physiology vastly differs from that of humans. Her veins and digestive system are non-functional. She consumes her prey by melting it into black sludge with the highly caustic secretions of her skin, before absorbing it back through her pores. The waste material collects in her stomach, which she then expels voluntarily through an action similar to vomiting. This is often used defensively or in hunting prey, as the unfortunate Robert Orlean found out. As a result, people working in 811's containment chamber need to do so in pairs and wear heavily sealed hazmat suits for obvious safety reasons. The creature also proved to be surprisingly intelligent. While not a genius by any means, it was no mere mindless animal. The Swamp Woman had an intellect and communication skills on par with your average feral child. The one that had been brought up and socialized in a relatively normal home before being turned loose and experiencing a decline in its mental and social development. Her words have a childlike construction to them, as though English isn't her native language, and she's still in the very early stages of learning it. She gave herself a name, I, and began to cooperate well with Foundation staff in exchange for having her needs met. Since being brought into containment, she's made a number of requests. These include some requests that have been denied by the Foundation, such as the regular provision of bovine prey for its chamber, and a variety of fish from its native environment to make it feel more at home. However, there are some requests that the Foundation has approved, like a wooden hairbrush and a D-class in a hazmat suit entering the room daily, in order to help wash her hair often bogged down by the frequency at which her skin produces thick, caustic oils. In one particularly strange request, she asked for a turtle in a hazmat suit to act as a companion in her containment chamber, as she reacted negatively to the idea of having turtles as food. Sadly, this was one of the denied requests. SCP-811 was also involved in a few cross-tests with other anomalies, leading to curious results. After realizing just how dangerous SCP-811 secretions could be, Foundation researchers naturally floated the idea of using it on SCP-682 in its seemingly endless termination experiments. A sample of 682's flesh was successfully decayed by the dangerous mucus, so a larger quantity collected over a number of months was then sprayed all over the beast. It managed to reduce 682's body mass by 27%, melting its way through the covered flesh down to the bone. However, at that point, it was unable to decay further, and SCP-682 soon returned back to its normal state. Who could have possibly seen that coming, right? However, a much more interesting and enlightening cross-test occurred with SCP-978, the Desire Camera. If you haven't already seen our video on the Desire Camera, it's pretty much exactly what the name suggests. 
a Polaroid camera that reveals the deepest desire of its subject. And the Foundation decided to test it on a large number of staff and anomalies, one of those being SCP-811. When a photograph was taken of SCP-811 just staring at the camera, the resulting photo depicted a human woman with the same height, build, and facial features as SCP-811 braiding yellow ribbons into her hair and wearing a blue sundress. The attending researchers felt this raised an interesting question. Were they looking at an aspiration towards humanity from SCP-811? Or was this a yearning to return to what had been before? There was only one way to find out. Conduct an interview with the creature itself. When the interview began, the researchers pressed 811 on some of her earliest memories. One of the key details she shared was regarding a mysterious man whom she claimed came to her before she looked like she did now, back when her skin was soft and pink. The bad man. He injected something into her arm and whatever it was, it changed her, mutated her, took away her precious humanity. The first thing she remembered feeling after that was an all-consuming hunger, and then melting and devouring the one who changed her destroying any possible answers as to who he was or why he did it in the process. It was a story of victimization and dehumanization so cruel and upsetting that researcher Watchtel, an assistant researcher attending the interview, actually threw up. Later debriefing interviews revealed it was because he had a daughter of roughly the same age, with long, dark hair. If SCP-811 has any parents herself, we may never know. Such is the strange tragedy of SCP-811. Whether you wish to call her by her number, a nickname like the Swamp Woman, or her self-given name of Ai, we'll likely never know who she was before, as not even she knows now. It is an unsettling reminder that all of our grasps on humanity are looser than you think. Sometimes all it takes is one chance encounter to change who you are completely. The site director was boiling over with rage. This was supposed to be a safe facility, one where low-threat and well-behaved humanoid SCPs were kept with minimal security. But if this kept up, these containment breaches could easily bring the attention of SCP brass, the last thing any of them wanted. Can anyone explain? The director demanded, pausing to calm himself. Why do we have so much trouble keeping this subject safely contained? This is not the first containment breach! The security team looked at each other nervously. Well, sir, nothing is ever certain. We made sure everyone has the proper security protocols in place, but SCPs are always unpredictable. It's a little girl! The director slammed his fist on the table. Look at these security protocols! Stuffed animals! Playtime! This girl is obviously not a threat! So what's going on here? The security heads exchanged another nervous glance. Ah, uh, you're right, sir. The specimen isn't the security threat here. It's the researchers. SCP-2118 was secured by the Foundation with both minimal apprehension as well as a smaller team of personnel, after multiple reports of her unique abilities were identified. She appears to be a normal child under 10 years of age, with orange hair and a long scar on her right cheek. 2118 claims that her scar is the result of an assault by a stranger on the street. She communicated this via sign language, as she rarely, if ever, vocalizes words. She is, however, capable of speech, and that is where her unique abilities lie. SCP-2118 does not speak in her own voice, and it is still unclear as to whether or not she even possesses one. Her speech only activates in one situation, in the presence of a parent who has lost a child under the age of 18 to death. Under this circumstance, only will SCP-2118 begin to speak, but rarely in the same voice twice because SCP-2118's voice isn't her own. Automatically and involuntarily, 2118's voice pattern becomes that of the child who died, speaking to their parent in a way that reflects both the age and gender of their deceased offspring. The voice that is heard is referred to as SCP-2118-01 by the Foundation. SCP-2118 is aware of her speech and vocal patterns as well as the psychological distress they cause the parent, 
as she will use sign language to apologize even as SCP-2118-01 continues speaking. But this isn't the only disturbing part of her abilities. While at first the conversation can be generic, most times the words and sounds coming out of SCP-2118's mouth reflect the final words and sounds of the dead child. This not only includes disturbing pleas for help, but can reflect the actual sounds of dying, mimicking the agony of drowning, disease, or death by fire. SCP-2118 wasn't necessarily a danger to anyone, However, her presence could absolutely pose a dangerous temptation. The director finished looking over the files. It seemed like everything had been handled smoothly and by the books when SCP-2118 was initially brought in. But along the way, something had gone wrong. The case was being handled by one of his most trusted researchers, Dr. Wu. As it became clear that SCP-2118 didn't talk normally, translators who could interpret ASL were brought in for the first interview. Dr. Wu and site psychologist Dr. Lavoy welcomed this strange little girl to the SCP facility. This interview provided the Foundation its first intel on where SCP-2118 had come from. At first, the little girl was alarmed. She didn't like being referred to by her SCP number and insisted on her original name. She understood that she was in a science lab of some sort, but thought she had been brought there because she had done something wrong. She referenced a woman attacking her with her purse at one point, and also claimed that any time she spoke, people would get angry. But then she revealed something more disturbing. She knew why people got angry when she spoke. From her mother. She had lived with her parent, and at some point her mother had lost a baby. After the traumatic incident, every time 2118 spoke, she spoke in the voice of the sibling she had lost. This caused her mother to become angry, and out of shame, provoked 2118 to glue her own mouth shut to prevent it from happening. Due to the glue being a little too strong, it resulted in a visit to the hospital, something she thought might happen again at the facility. But no one was sure if she was scared of it, or hoping for it. More than anything, the little girl just didn't want people to stop talking to her. The Foundation had a long way to go in understanding SCP-2118's abilities. Dr. Lavoie and Dr. Wu both seemed to have a good rapport with the girl, and they were kept in charge of her case. Neither one had children and could converse with her without difficulty as long as a translator was present. But to test her abilities, there would have to be an experiment conducted involving someone who could actually activate them. And it just so happened that D-3498, a volatile conscript working at the facility had been convicted of the murder of his wife and his daughter. But the experiment would prove to be more than anyone was bargaining for. As soon as D-3498 was brought in, SCP-2118 became silent. After about 30 seconds, she signed an apology for what was about to happen and then began screaming at the top of her lungs. She cried out for her father in an anguished voice, all while signing apologies. D-3498 became increasingly angry, demanding to know what was going on. He struggled against his restraints and howled obscenities as he listened to his daughter's strangled pleas for help, begging and ultimately her death rattle. Two agents, recorded as Agent M and Agent C, were brought in to end the experiment and remove D-3498. And that's when things took an unexpected turn. While Agent C removed the D-Class, Agent M seemed oddly fixated on SCP-2118. The reason why became clear as soon as SCP-2118 opened her mouth. Mama? The voice had changed completely, to that of a young boy several years older than the D-Class's daughter. The boy seemed distraught, complaining of being cold and scared and wanting to know where his mother was. Agent M seemed frozen in place and didn't answer Dr. Lavoie's questions. The experiment was quickly terminated. SCP-2118 was removed to her living quarters and Agent M was removed from duty with the case of a possible missing or murdered child referred to police authorities. SCP-2118 may have cracked a cold case, but she also posed a dangerous temptation. It wouldn't be long before the case had its first security breach. Researcher Anselman conducted an interview with SCP-2118, despite not being assigned to the case. Anselman didn't have access to the SCP's living quarters, so he watched SCP-2118 sleep and then communicated with her through the glass. The events were captured on facility cameras and showed that SCP-2118 was agitated from the start, 
knowing that Anselman was not supposed to be there, and Anselman had an ulterior motive. As soon as the conversation began, SCP-2118 using sign language asked Anselman why she was being made to do this. Soon afterwards, SCP-2118 started speaking in the voice of a prepubescent boy that Anselman called Dewey, and who referred to Anselman as Dad. The boy was clearly agitated, as was SCP-2118, and asked his father what happens after they die. Anselman became upset, wanting to hear answers from his lost son, not questions. SCP-2118 tried to warn him off, letting Anselman know that he couldn't actually communicate with his son through her, and she couldn't help him. But Anselman persisted, watching as SCP-2118 imitated the sound of a boy gasping and taking his last breaths consistent with a death from illness rather than accident or violence. All the while, SCP-2118 just watched sadly. The security breach was soon discovered, and researcher Anselman was removed and reprimanded for unauthorized testing with SCP-2118. But thanks to the researcher's breach, the Foundation did gain new knowledge of SCP-2118's abilities, namely that she couldn't actually channel the spirits of the dead. She was a mimic who could involuntarily duplicate their last moments, but couldn't provide any new information from them or answer questions that they didn't know in life, and she didn't have any special knowledge of what came after life. But her abilities did have one unique potential. By channeling the last moments of a deceased child, she could possibly provide answers for authorities as to their whereabouts or their killer, as she had unexpectedly done with Agent M. The problem was, this process seemed to be deeply disturbing for SCP-2118, who showed great emotional distress when forced to channel a dead child and consistently apologized for the effect on the parents, which left the Foundation in an ethical dilemma. Sir, how do you want to proceed? The site director looked over the files. Clearly this couldn't continue, and something needed to be done. But none of the security breaches or other incidents had been SCP-2118's fault. She had been cooperative, despite the trauma these tests seemed to cause her. To keep her safe and to preserve her use to the Foundation, things would need to change. We could transfer SCP-2118 to a more secure facility, but I'm not going to do that. Keep herself furnished with all the things a girl her age would want. It says here that she likes orcas and elephants. Take her outside to an enclosed play area once a day for about an hour, no more. But above all, make sure she's always with an attendant who can converse in sign language. She's not to be around anyone who has had children unless it's necessary for testing. Convey these new parameters to Doctors Wu and Lavoie, and make sure to increase security around her quarters, as much for her protection as anything else. The security team scurried off happy to have avoided the director's wrath. The director turned back to the files. Yes, he had solved the problem for now, but he would have to keep a closer eye on the facility as a whole. The SCP Foundation did close background checks on its staff and on D-Class personnel before bringing them in, but SCPs were unpredictable, and you never knew what could make someone a security risk. How many employees working at the facility had lost a child? How many, like the disgraced researcher Anselman, would do anything to hear their child's voice again, even if it was in the middle of death? Gather round, boys and girls, and those who are young at heart. We've talked a lot before about the wacky, occasionally wonderful, but always weird creations of the mysterious toy maker Dr. Wondertainment, and today we're going to do it again. It's time to crack open the SCP Foundation's toy chest and see what we can find inside. Dr. Wondertainment's inventions have been attracting the attention of the Foundation for quite some time, and with good reason. Whoever or whatever the whimsical, talented doctor is, there's no one else out there producing quite as many anomalous objects and marketing them to children as playthings. These aren't the toys you'll find in your neighborhood store or on someone's Amazon wish list. There's SCP-445, the super paper that comes alive in the form of whatever you fold it into, SCP-1508, or Mikey the Chore Buddy, a living cardboard robot designed to help kids with their chores. There are the adorable yet destructive fire-breathing dragon snails, or SCP-111, or SCP-958 General Beep, who teaches kids about military history and combat and helps them build real working toy weapons. I could keep talking through the proverbial toy factory, 
but we'd be here all day. Maybe Dr. Wondertainment's most anomalous trait is how productive he manages to be. I can barely send a single email without three cups of coffee, but enough about me. One of the most well-known Dr. Wondertainment creations is the Little Misters line, a series of humanoid playmates with a variety of different traits. We've covered the Little Misters here on SCP Explained before, but let's do a quick refresh, just in case. There's Mr. Chameleon, Mr. Headless, Mr. Laugh, Mr. Forgetful, Mr. Shapey, Mr. Soap, Mr. Hungry, Mr. Brass, Mr. Hot, Mr. Life and Mr. Death, Mr. Fish, Mr. Moon, Mr. Red, Mr. Money, Mr. Lost, Mr. Lie, Mr. Mad, Mr. Scary, and Mr. Stripes. Each of these little misters, from the top hat-wearing fish to the man who can't remember a thing, they're each special in their own way. But wait a minute. Looking at them all lined up like that, I can't help but feel like I'm missing something. It seems like a bit of a boys club, right? And why let boys have all the fun? Well, it seems like Dr. Wondertainment thought the very same thing, because he made a little mister just for girls. Enter Miss Sweetie, the sweetest, pinkest gal around. At first glance, you might mistake Miss Sweetie for an ordinary woman, aside from her naturally pink hair and eyes. No wig or contact lenses here, but like the rest of her fellow misters, Miss Sweetie has more to her than meets the eye. So what lies beneath that candy-coated, sugary exterior? To crack open that hard candy shell and get the truth inside, we'll have to look a few years back to when Miss Sweetie first caught the attention of the Foundation. It all started in a small, unassuming town, tucked away in a valley flanked on either side by mountains and thick forests. It was a peaceful place, if a bit boring. The worst thing anyone could remember happening in years was a cheating scandal at the yearly pie bake-off. Then, 10-year-old Nina went missing. Her family was terrified. They called the police right away, but the authorities insisted that it looked like a classic case of a little girl running away from home. After all, she had taken her backpack, her favorite toys, some sandwiches, and bottles of water from the fridge. She would come back home soon, probably later that day, and everyone would be able to laugh about this by tomorrow. But tomorrow came, and Nina still didn't return home. People began to whisper, the way folks in small towns always talk behind each other's backs. Was there some trouble at home? Nina had seemed like such a happy girl, so outgoing, leading her troop in Girl Scout cookie sales every year and singing solos in the school choir. Something must have been wrong, though. Otherwise, where did she go? Then others began to disappear. Tommy Bowers was last spotted walking home from school. He fell behind his friends, stopping to tie his shoe. When they noticed he was no longer with them and went back, he was gone. Then Mikey Paulson vanished on a camping trip in the nearby forest. His father left him alone for a second in broad daylight, just to gather some firewood for later that evening. And when he called out to his son for help carrying it, there was no reply. One boy was catching toads in the creek behind his house when he disappeared. Another was seemingly snatched while walking his dog. The dog, unharmed, ran back home on her own, dragging her leash behind her as she went. It had started with Nina, but now no one could be certain if it would stop. The townspeople began to panic, wondering who would be next, who was taking their children, and why. As it always does in small communities in the grips of terror, suspicion began to grow. Neighbors turned on each other, pointing fingers at anyone who seemed the least bit suspicious. Local police were baffled by the sudden slew of apparent kidnappings. Sure, they had a few potential suspects, an elderly woman with the local kids claiming that she was a witch, a school groundskeeper that just had a generally weird vibe about him, but none of the leads ever went anywhere. There was no evidence found at any of the scenes. Where there were footprints, there were only one set, the child's, leading off into the woods until they could no longer be tracked. Tensions were mounting, and no one could trust anyone anymore. In a town where people had always left their doors unlocked, people were boarding up their windows, pulling their children out of school, and keeping them home at all hours of the day. If they didn't, after all, their child could be the next one to vanish. After a week of nail-biting tension and looking for threats around every corner, the town was treated to a shocking surprise. Nina came home, casually as you please, her parents saw her come skipping down the driveway, 
a little dirty and clearly exhausted, but cheerful. They embraced her weeping and she hugged them tight, asking them to please stop crying. We didn't know where you were, her mother sobbed. Didn't know if you were okay or... I'm fine, Nina insisted. They let you go? Her father asked. What? I just got hungry and I missed you, so I came back, Nina explained. Who took you? Her mother asked. No one took me. I was visiting my friend, Nina laughed. Her parents stared at her in shock. What? Friend? Her father stammered. The pink lady in the woods, Nina said simply, and then she rushed inside to grab a snack and say hello to the family cat. Police came by the house to speak with Nina, and after talking in circle about her friend in the woods and refusing to say that she was kidnapped, she agreed to show the officers where this lady in the woods was. Other than her location, all they could get out of Nina was that the lady was pink, she could do magic, and she had lots of friends. They had no way to know for certain, but they hoped that this mysterious woman would lead them to the missing boys. So that same day, a team of police officers, none of whom had ever seen more action than a parking ticket or a teenage vandal spray painting a wall, set out to recover the kidnapped children from the lady in the woods. It wasn't easy to navigate, following the directions of a child. What exactly did she mean by, go past the rock shaped like a butt, or look out for those purple flowers I like? In spite of their obstacles, though, they were able to get their bearings. They realized they were getting close, though close to what they couldn't quite be sure, when Officer Rita Flynn stepped on something that crunched loudly beneath her boot. What the? She lifted her shoe to find a piece of bright blue hard candy broken beneath the sole. Candy in the middle of the woods. As they searched the area around them, the rest of the officers found pieces of the same candy in different shapes and colors, all strangely inviting for candy that they found on the ground. They couldn't explain the significance of the candy, but they knew it meant they were getting close. They followed the multicolored candy trail like Hansel and Gretel tracking their path through the forest with crumbs of bread. They could hear footsteps up ahead, coming from a nearby clearing. Through the trees, the team of officers could make out a log cabin that looked like it had been abandoned for quite some time. As they drew closer to the cabin and the sounds of activity inside, several of the officers suddenly froze in their tracks. They insisted to be allowed to turn back to go home. They couldn't explain why, but they knew they needed to leave, that something did not want them there. Officer Flynn, the only female officer in the group, scoffed at her colleagues. She urged them not to be cowards and to keep moving. There were children's lives at stake. This was no time to get cold feet. Still tentative, but feeling thoroughly shamed, the rest of the officers followed Rita towards the cabin. So far, so good. No sign of the missing boys, but no sign of foul play yet either. Then, behind her, Flynn heard Officer Simon let out a groan of pain. She turned and saw him doubled over, clutching his stomach. Before anyone could intervene, his knees buckled, and he fell to the ground, suddenly unconscious. Flynn ran to check his pulse, and it was steady, but he wouldn't wake up. His breath gave off a slightly sweet smell, and she remembered her great uncle and a trip he'd taken to the hospital. Somehow, Officer Simon had fallen into a diabetic coma right there in the woods. Before she had time to think too hard about it, Officer Paul collapsed in the exact same way right before her eyes. All around her as they attempted to approach the cabin, Flynn's fellow officers were dropping like flies. She turned back to the cabin, and her eye caught the shock of pink hair as a woman stepped out. She made eye contact with Flynn, who took note of her unusual vivid pink eyes, and she waved. Hi there, what's your name? She called in a syrupy sweet voice. Officer Flynn drew her weapon. Hands where I can see them. The pink-haired woman cocked her head in confusion, but complied. No need to be so mean, she pouted. It's just us girls. But that wasn't entirely true. In the forest behind the cabin, Officer Flynn could see humanoid figures trudging through the trees. But they weren't human. They were shiny, hard, and brightly colored. She thought of the candy she had stepped on earlier, and her jaw dropped. As the candy people approached her, she began to recognize their faces. The missing boys, each and every one of them, transformed somehow into living hard candy. Holding her weapon in one hand and keeping an eye on the pink-haired woman and her tiny candy army all the while, she pulled out her radio and called in the strangest report 
she had ever made. No one in the town, not even the chief of police, had ever heard of anything like this. But fortunately, the police chief knew someone who did. An old friend who devoted her time to investigating cases that were impossible to explain. Less than 24 hours after Officer Flynn made her call, the SCP Foundation was arriving at the scene to collect the candy children and the woman who would become known as Miss Sweetie. Officer Flynn's report, along with an in-depth study of both the hard candy pieces and the hard candy humanoids obtained from the crime scene, offered some insights into Miss Sweetie's abilities. Her presence inherently repels men that come within 50 yards of her, and any man that enters her radius will feel an immense desire to leave and go back in the opposite direction. If he is forced to continue his approach, then he will begin to feel ill, experiencing nausea, shortness of breath, and severe stomach pain. Finally, he would fall into what resembles a spontaneous diabetic coma. The only way for him to regain consciousness is to be brought back outside of the 50-yard radius. As for the hard candy, Foundation researchers gave one piece to a female D-class and another piece to a male D-class to test the effect it might have on different genders. When the woman ate her piece, she simply chewed, swallowed, and looked at the attending researcher in confusion as if to say, what, was that it? When the man ate his piece, however, his body began to undergo a rapid transformation. His blood sugar levels skyrocketed, rendering him immobile almost immediately. Over the next 12 hours, his flesh, bones, musculature, and all other parts of his body began to crystallize into hard candy. When the transformation was complete, the new entity attempted to free Miss Sweetie from her containment. He was neutralized using a flamethrower, which melted the sugar of his body down into a sticky puddle. Any person identifying as a male who eats a piece of this hard candy will experience a similar effect, just as the missing boys did. In some very rare cases, the transformed party will turn into a candy unicorn, rather than a humanoid creature, but the cause of these special cases is unknown. After Miss Sweetie was brought into Foundation custody and given her official designation of SCP-2396, specialized containment procedures were put in place to keep her in captivity. She was placed in Provisional Site 2396, and due to her distaste for men and boys, assigned a research staff that consisted entirely of women. Any men or masculine identifying individuals located within a six kilometer radius of the site were to be temporarily detained and questioned about any possible contact with SCP-2396. So every night in Provisional Site 2396 was ladies' night, but it wasn't much of a party. Researchers were preoccupied with finding a way to neutralize SCP-2396's anomalous effects. Most notably, in spite of her containment, small pieces of assorted hard candy, or SCP-2396-A, would be spontaneously generated within a six kilometer radius of Miss Sweetie. Any of these that were spotted would be incinerated on site, but the mobile task force in charge of supervising the area was having trouble keeping up. Male civilians were slipping through the cracks, eating the candy, and transforming into candy humanoids, or instances of SCP-2396-B, then storming the site and attempting to free Miss Sweetie from captivity. It was becoming untenable to keep her contained. The generation of instances of SCP-2396-A was directly connected to her regular consumption of sugar in all of its forms, which she requested as rations. The amount did not matter, nor did the form it took. She merely required something sweet once a day. Sometimes it was a bowl of pure cane sugar, sometimes a cup of maple syrup. On a staff member's birthday, they brought her a piece of chocolate cake, which she was especially delighted by. Eventually, they settled on a single liter of glucose syrup once a day, hoping it could slow things down by eliminating any whimsy or variation from the feedings. Every time, without fail, more instances of the anomalous candy would manifest soon after SCP-2396 ate her meal. There was talk of starving her to see if this could mitigate the generation of candies, but when denied sugary foods, Miss Sweetie would double over in pain, wailing about the agony she felt. The head researcher at the provisional site was horrified by the notion of torturing an anomaly that had done no intentional harm to anyone and insisted they find another way. One researcher, Dr. O'Hareley, proposed a solution. Why not try a sugar substitute? They decided to test it out, giving SCP-2396 a liter of liquid sucralose, while behaving as though it was her ordinary dose of sugar. 
She accepted it graciously and made no complaints of pain at all. After switching to the sucralose, the candy stopped appearing. Miss Sweetie was reclassified as Euclid and moved to Psych-19. After a week of the sucralose-based containment procedures, Dr. O'Hearley conducted her fifth interview with SCP-2396. For the sake of avoiding any potential outbursts, Miss Sweetie was led to believe that she was still producing candy as well as living candy creatures. A transcript of this interview is included in SCP-2396's official file. Dr. O'Hearley sat down at the table, where Miss Sweetie was already waiting with a pleasant smile on her face. Good morning, SCP-2396, Dr. O'Hearley began. Miss Sweetie scoffed and giggled at this opener. Oh, come on, Cindy. You don't have to be all stuffy with your best gal. Dr. O'Hearley responded with a polite smile, neglecting to correct SCP-2396 on the fact that Cindy was not, in fact, her real name. All right, SCP-2396, are you aware another SCP-2396-B attempted to breach your containment? She referred here to one of Miss Sweetie's candy soldiers. Miss Sweetie giggled. That's just boys. Always gotta be making a big stink of things when they wanna get your attention. Ain't it always like that? Never a man, always a boy. Always beating up their friends when they think they're getting too close. A man's always gotta have his hands busy or else they're gonna be in the air. Dr. O'Hearley pressed the matter. They seem to be concentrating on taking you away from here. Are you unhappy here, SCP-2396? Miss Sweetie sighed. A woman ain't happy anywhere, isn't that what they say? Dr. O'Hearley frowned. I'm not aware of any such saying. Miss Sweetie shrugged. It should be one. I don't know, Lucy. I just think it's because every gal wants this big strong bug to sweep her off her feet. And these are sweet boys deep down, even if they're sticky. I'm sure they'd sweep you off your feet, too, if you girls asked. Dr. O'Hearley thought about commenting on the inherent sexism and heteronormativity of this statement, but thought better of it. She also considered pointing out that Lucy was not her name either, but shook it off. Then what about the instances that resemble unicorns? Miss Sweetie lit up at the mention of these. Don't you just love unicorns? All little girls love unicorns. You can eat them, too when you get bored. Little girls get bored. It's good to have boys and unicorns you can eat when you're finished. Isn't that a little reductive? Dr. O'Hearley replied. Miss Sweetie appeared to become irritated. She rolled her eyes. Look, toots, I'm a girl's toy and it's a man's world. What do you want from me? Is that why you repel men? Because you're a girl's toy? Miss Sweetie nodded. Dr. W didn't like it when boys break their sister's toys. Told me it was damn near the worst thing in the world. And they can't break me. They can't even come near me. Well, except if they're, you know, all sweet and handsome. And you're happy with the way things are. Dr. O'Hearley asked. Miss Sweetie paused for a moment to consider, then answered, Dr. W's good in my book. I always had a sweet tooth, and I always wanted to be a girl. Kind of an okay trade-off, if you ask me. You guys ain't so bad, though. Even if the food's crap. Don't know how you mess up sugar, Sarah, but you guys make it taste like crap. Aside from complaining about its taste and no longer being able to produce any of her anomalous candy, the sucralose substitute had no adverse effects on SCP-2396. At this point in time, no containment measures beyond this dietary change and making sure all staff that interact with her identify as women have been necessary. So, Miss Sweetie sits in her cell in the low security wing of Psych-19, missing her favorite sugary treats but otherwise content with the way things are. And on the outside, no more unsuspecting boys are being transformed into confectionery against their will. Just to be safe though, if you're ever out walking and you see pieces of delicious looking hard candy scattered along the ground, just remember what your parents always said. Don't take candy from strangers. You just never know where it came from. The perfect childhood. School is out, shoes are off. You're sprinting across the hot sandy beach smiling for no apparent reason, because back then you didn't even need one. Did I mention there's an orange cone on your head? Where did it come from? Why is it there? What is the point? Do not think too deeply about it. There is no room for symbolism in the summer. There is no use overanalyzing the antics of teenage youth. It's just a cone and you're just a kid, doing things for no other reason than that you want to. You're busy living, doing your thing. Responsibility is still years away. Such a pretty picture we're painting, isn't it? But this is SCP Explained, so of course by now, 
You figured out this is all a misdirection, didn't you? Well, here it comes. Watch closely. Look at you run, moving towards nothing as if it means everything. Look at that smile, the wind whipping through the gap in your teeth. Soak it in. In 20 years, your face muscles will have forgotten the movement. Look at you live. Yes, go on. Soak it in. You will be chasing this feeling your whole life, while moving further and further away from it. Oof. Depressing, isn't it? We think so too. But here is the silver lining. Something you'd be wise to celebrate. At least you have this moment to look back on. The memory is with you forever. Not everyone is so lucky. Not everyone had a good childhood. Furthermore, not everyone even has a childhood at all. Some live beyond the expectations of age. Imagine a 14-year-old forced to be 40. That's not to say they have to pay taxes or can run for Senate. No, this level of forced maturity that I'm speaking of transcends the scope of average adulthood. So let's not imagine a kid going through the mundane life of a cubicle junkie, filing papers, pretending to work, and answering phone calls. Instead, let's do this. Imagine a kid going to war. Imagine a kid carrying out stealth assassination missions. Imagine a kid being locked in containment, living with little human interaction and freedom. This is all to say, imagine a kid not being a kid at all. Now this is more like an SCP Explained. This is the sad story of someone who had to say goodbye to the joys of adolescence earlier than anyone ever should have to. In fact, they didn't even get to say goodbye at all. This is the story of SCP-105. Now, to be clear, SCP-105 is not a bloodthirsty demon living in the shadows. It is not an unsquishable spider dancing across your hardwood floor, mocking the soles of your shoes as they stomp down with no success. It is not a grand piano in a hotel lobby absorbing the DNA of all who touches its keys. And it is not a freezer that tempts late night snackers to reach deeper and deeper towards an ever elusive hot fudge sundae until they are sucked in frozen solid, sold for millions and displayed as decorative ice sculptures atop the center of punch bowls at parties for rich politicians. No, we'll just have to get to those later on on a different day. Because SCP-105 is just, mm, how do I put this, a girl. Yes, a small, unremarkable looking girl. At the time of acquisition, she was just 1.5 meters tall and weighed 50 kilograms. Even those of you listening with little to no instinctual senses for converting meters and kilograms to feet and pounds can still understand this is no frightful giant we're talking about. Lining up a class by height, she'd blend in somewhere toward the middle. And if you look even closer, beyond the shallow surface of measurements and toward the details of her face, even still, you won't find a single freckle to fear. SCP-105 has blue eyes and blonde hair. Nothing coastal Californians haven't seen a million times over just this Monday. Formerly known as Iris Thompson, SCP-105 has no discernible oddities. If you saw her jumping rope, you wouldn't point and stare. If you saw her at the park, playing with your children, you wouldn't pull them away and squeeze them tight. If you saw her walking toward you on a sidewalk, you wouldn't turn around and run away in the other direction. By herself, SCP-105 is not too different from anyone else. No matter how close we zoom in on her appearance, personality, or her tendencies, there is nothing to see that triggers alarms. If you ask her to spit fire, she won't. If you conduct a lab experiment where she has to find the exit of a maze using only her sense of smell, she will get lost and fail. This is all to say if you look too closely through the microscope at SCP-105, you might miss her anomalous abilities. Instead, you'd be better off taking a step back and just watching her live her life. And that is all that she wanted to do, live her life. Is that so much to ask? The first thing you will notice is that she isn't alone. And like in any good buddy-buddy film, her counterpart reveals more to her character. So who is standing by her side? Who is the co-star of this film that pushes our protagonist into the Foundation spotlight? Well, it's no person at all. It's a camera. Her camera. 
SCP-105-B is a Polaroid One Step Express, manufactured in 1982. It does not appear to have any out-of-the-ordinary physical characteristics and appears to be, for all intents and purposes, a normal Polaroid camera, operating as expected for all persons aside from SCP-105. When you point it at a subject, they don't get sucked into the lens. The flash can't blind an army of soldiers. When you say cheese, it doesn't shoot out a brick of cheddar. The camera is nothing more than a camera. That is, until it's in the hands of Iris Thompson. What's more unique than the camera itself are the photographs it produces. When SCP-105 holds a photograph taken by SCP-105-B, the picture changes from a still shot to that of a real-time image of the person, location, or object photographed. Regardless of the subject of the photograph, the image will convert itself into what appears to be a handheld live stream of whatever was pictured. Imagine a photograph of a waterfall. If held by SCP-105, you do not just see the image of a waterfall, but you will physically see the water falling, splashing down onto the rocks below. It is similar to holding your cell phone and watching a GIF. However, instead of just watching, Iris is able to interact with it in a way beyond any technology has ever allowed. SCP-105 is then able to move her arm through and into the photograph and manipulate objects within reach of the original point at which the photograph was first taken. Yes, you heard me right. SCP-105-2 doesn't just offer Iris quick prints of memories, it gives her much more, granting her access to a new dimension. Although this is clearly a unique situation for Iris, it doesn't mean that Iris is the only one affected by this anomaly. When she engages with the photographs, it actually affects the world attached to them. That is to say, there are consequences to her actions. Every photograph she has ever taken is essentially a portal to a world of problems. Witnesses who have been on the other side of the photograph while SCP-105 was manipulating it reported seeing her hand reaching out from an invisible portal and carrying on whatever actions she pleases. Once her arm is inside the photograph, she has the freedom to control the image as she wishes. This ability has obvious benefits for anyone. Imagine being able to carry around with you a photograph of your oven. Then, whenever you get that paranoid feeling that you forgot to turn it off, you can reach into the Polaroid and turn the dial how you please. But the peace of mind is just a small benefit of this power, and it's easy to assume that anyone would be tempted to use their abilities for far more than just controlling at-home kitchen appliances while on vacation. The Foundation specifically concerns itself with bigger, more ambitious uses of anomalous power. And the power in this case wasn't just in the camera. While 105-B helps Iris use her powers most efficiently, she is still able to manipulate objects through photographs taken by other cameras, though not quite as well as when she's using her favorite camera. Noting that 105-B and the photographs taken by said camera have no unusual properties when used by any other person except for SCP-105, it was clear to the Foundation who the greater anomaly in the situation really was. The tool wasn't of their interest, but rather the person wielding it. But how did this all come to their attention? Is the Foundation really investigating the life of a girl playing with a camera in her bedroom? Well, some moments are just too big to be bound by privacy. SCP-105 was brought to the forefront of the Foundation's attention shortly after the murder of her boyfriend. Promptly after his death, the police investigated the scene and looked for answers. And when looking for answers, they started conjuring up questions, one of which put Iris at the center of their search. Where were you? Her response wasn't so straightforward. She wasn't there, but then she was. The police pressed further, not understanding. SCP-105 explained that she was at home, but once she learned of his death, she hurried over to him. This left the police even more suspicious, as there was no way she could have been informed of the murder by an outside source. She must have been there all along. Seeing the skepticism in their faces, SCP-105 scrambled for an explanation. She took a deep breath and got her story straight. She claimed to have been on the phone with her boyfriend at the time of the violent attack, and once she heard the commotion, it prompted her to hurry over to his location, where she saw him dead. This excuse made logical sense, and so the police dropped their suspicion. After all, Iris was just a small, innocent teenager. However, just as quickly as the police moved on from Iris, they returned to her. 
this time with tangible proof of their doubts. The telephone records did not correspond to her story. She was never on the phone with her boyfriend that night. It was then that SCP-105 had to confess. She informed her lawyer that she had, in fact, been there for the murder. Well, not there, but kind of there. She explained how she witnessed the murder through a photograph she had taken with her boyfriend several days prior. The attorney in question disregarded the story and recommended that the subject plead guilty. Iris, however, refused to do so. She was sticking to her truth, no matter how crazy it made her seem. She went forward and told her story in court. It was met with derision. The judge and the jury didn't even entertain the possibility of any of it being true. Iris was flustered. She was a young teenage girl fighting for her freedom, her only weapon being the truth. But the room wasn't participating in her reality. They dismissed her as crazy. And so, when Iris offered to demonstrate her ability, it was the last straw. The judge wouldn't allow Iris to waste any more of anyone's time. She was sentenced to a psychiatric ward. Iris was determined to get out of there. She knew she didn't belong. Luckily, someone else knew, too, that she didn't belong. And because of this, in a matter of days, she was out of there. But home wasn't where she was heading. No, it wasn't mom and dad picking her up from the psychiatric ward, but rather the foundation breaking her out, stealing her for themselves, and bringing her to Site-17. There at Site-17, Foundation personnel began their mission, which started with trying to convince SCP-105 that they were on her side. They began by retrieving SCP-105-B from SCP-105's home and replacing it with an identical model, only then to give it to her under the lie that it was the original. The lies wouldn't stop just there. They'd continue to pour over her reality until it was impossible for her to recognize one from the other. SCP-105's parents was informed that she was killed during the botched escape of another patient while both were in the custody of a psychiatric care facility. In truth, though, the Foundation wants nothing more than to keep SCP-105 alive. However, they are not concerned about the quality of her living. Iris was a tool for the Foundation. She was an asset. She was a secret weapon. She had powers they could have only dreamed of. Only now, they existed. But before shooting their shiny new weapon, they needed to learn how to use it properly. But with what manual? How do you learn how to use another human? Well, having seen enough Marvel movies, they knew they would be better equipped with knowledge if they understood her origin story. So they began questioning Iris, trying to get to the root cause of her anomalous aptitude. She was either 10 or 11. She remembers because she was looking at a picture of the ocean, and she noticed that the waves began moving. Her parents said that she just had an overactive imagination. When she first was able to move objects in the photos, she was 11, 12 maybe. Her family took a trip to the Grand Canyon. She looked through the photo album after they got home, and she brushed her hand up against one by accident. When she did, she pushed a rock over the edge, falling into the canyon. She could actually hear it clatter on the way down. She became fascinated with photography after that. Most of the time, it didn't work with photographs she took, but her parents got her a Polaroid one-step express camera that she'd been begging them for since Christmas. After she got the camera, the photos got easier to interact with. After hearing her story, the researchers made her an offer. She'd be allowed certain freedoms if she agreed to use her powers to do them a few favors. She could, at least in some capacity, act her age, socialize, and do things a girl her grade would normally do. But in exchange, she had to first do things that nobody any age should ever have to do. Iris agreed, and it was in this agreement that we see just how desperate she was during her childhood. She was willing to risk everything for something as small as a quick conversation with a guard, five minutes of jump rope, or simply a few minutes spent under the sun. She was assigned to be part of Mobile Task Force Omega-7 to carry out a wide range of missions. And if the fate of the first humanoid SCP recruited to Mobile Task Force Omega-7 was any indication how this might play out, Iris was in a lot of trouble. The Pandora's Box initiative had a history of failure. Their previous efforts under Team Able ended in the death of absolutely everyone. However, Team Iris began on a more hopeful note. They carried out different missions than Team Able. Instead of violent attacks, their primary missions were reconnaissance and intelligence gathering. However, just because there were no swords and blood drawn, the missions were not so harmless. Despite Team Iris carrying out over 20 jobs in cooperation with the Bow Commission, 
swiftly and without incident, their streak eventually had to come to an end. The first disciplinary incident for SCP-105 involved the escalation of Team Iris missions from reconnaissance to assassinations. Yes, this teenage girl with not a violent bone in her body was tasked to kill. Note that her only power is that of manipulating photos. In her mind, this is nothing more than a party trick. It was a gift she was born with, and she was always aware that it was unique, but never did she expect it to be a curse. She liked being able to straighten books and photographs of libraries. She liked being able to read into photos and hug her teddy bear that she no longer has. She liked being able to help, heal, and embrace history, not alter it. SCP-105 violently opposed the use of her abilities to carry out assassinations. They wanted her to murder people, and like any girl of her nature would, she resisted, but they kept pressing. While some teenage girls are pressured by parents to play sports they don't particularly care for, this one was pressured to kill. During these events, SCP-105 became emotionally distressed and attempted to deceive Foundation personnel into believing that her anomalous traits had disappeared. She claimed that she couldn't carry out the missions anymore. Her doctor submitted a report recommending that SCP-105 be reclassified as neutralized, undergo amnestic treatment, and be released to the public with regular monitoring. After further investigation, the Foundation realized the doctor was prioritizing SCP-105's emotional state over the goals of the Foundation. They had built a friendship. He was the one telling her to pretend not to have powers anymore. This was all found out. Thus, his recommendation to release Iris was denied. With nothing to lose at that point, the doctor even helped Iris try to escape the Foundation's custody. But this failed. She was captured, and the doctor was promptly discharged. At that point, Iris had to start over again to regain the trust of the Foundation. In yet another compromise, she re-demonstrated her anomalous abilities in exchange for the restoration of limited privileges. Nothing more than occasionally being allowed to jump rope, getting a lollipop every Thursday, and being informed of the recent trends on TikTok. And so, this is where we know her to be. Continuously making sacrifices in exchange for tiny teaspoons of teenage life. All the while she is growing older and older, unfulfilled by the years she passes. And so, while it is easy to look back on our childhood with lust and longing, at least it was there, and is still there now, safely stored in our memory, stored in the protection of the past. For Iris, this is not so. Her childhood is both behind her and in front of her. It is something she moved on from too quickly, and it is a future she fights for every day. Even when she is 97, gray, decrepit, and on her deathbed, she will be sacrificing her freedoms to feel 15. And so we have to wonder, is SCP-105 a danger to anyone at all? I leave you with a question. Are we more likely to be attacked by a dog or the master holding its leash? All small towns have their horror stories. Tales of places plagued by terrifying apparitions, unseen forces, and something waiting in the shadows to terrorize unsuspecting innocents. Sometimes it's a bridge at the edge of town, where a man in a bunny suit stalks, wielding an axe and looking for drivers who wander off of the main road. Sometimes it's a cabin in the woods rumored to house an old gnarled witch who steals people away and throws them into a giant soup pot. Maybe it's a cursed hotel where wicked spirits roam the halls and the guests check in but never check out. Or maybe, like the little town where 16-year-old Mark lived, it's a haunted house. Ever since he was a little boy, Mark had been terrified of the house at the end of the lane. He walked past it on his way to school each morning and on his way back in the late afternoon. The sight of it made his palms sweat, his heart beat just a little bit faster. It had once been a grand Victorian manor, with turrets and a wraparound porch painted a brilliant white. But over the years, the paint had faded to a dingy yellow, peeling away from the rotting wood. There were holes in the roof where the rain and snow dripped through between the shingles. The windows were caked with dust and grime, obscuring anything that might be hiding inside. Not that there should have been anything there. The house had been abandoned for decades. Still, whenever he passed it, Mark could swear he felt the presence of something in there, pacing, watching, waiting for him to come inside. The stories around town didn't help. His parents told him to ignore them, 
said that people just liked to talk when there was nothing else to do, to make up things to be afraid of because their lives were too boring otherwise. But he couldn't avoid it. On a Boy Scouts trip when he was 12, Mark had tried to cover his ears when the other boys gathered around the campfire with him and turned the topic to the old house, but they teased and taunted him until he listened. They leaned in, faces lit ghoulishly from below by the flickering orange flames, and whispered about the ghost that had taken up residence inside the house. A wealthy old woman had lived there a long, long time ago, they said. She was cruel, with a nasty temper. Everyone in town knew to avoid her, knowing she would throw things at them from her window, shout at them, even sick her guard dogs on them. But one group of boys in town couldn't resist giving her a good scare. They dressed up in all black, red devil masks covering their faces, and broke into her house late one night. When she awoke, they were standing at the foot of her bed, holding pitchforks and telling her that they had come to drag her to hell. Her heart stopped from pure terror at the sight. But her spirit lingered in the house, swearing revenge against anyone who ever dared cross her threshold again, especially teenage boys. Mark didn't sleep a wink the whole camping trip after hearing that. He swore then and there that no matter what, he would never go into that house. But everyone can be bought and everyone has a price. For Mark, that price was a car. He had been saving up as best he could, but it was tough to get a job with no way to transport himself there, and mowing lawns for his neighbors wasn't the most lucrative gig. So when he learned that his neighbor Oliver, home on a break from college, was getting rid of his old car, he begged to buy it. He doubted Oliver would go for it, knowing what a jerk the guy could be. But to Mark's surprise, Oliver gave him an offer. I'll tell you what. Oliver's face broke into a sadistic smile. I'll give you the car, if you can spend the whole night in the house at the end of the street, alone. Are you serious? Mark scoffed. Dead serious. Make it to sunrise without freaking out and bailing and the car's yours. We have a deal? Oliver stuck out his hand to shake. Every nerve in Mark's body was screaming at him to say no, but if he didn't agree, he wouldn't be able to afford a car until he was in college. With a defeated sigh, he took Oliver's hand. Deal. But as night fell and Mark prepared to meet Oliver outside of the derelict old house, he could feel pangs of regret deep in his stomach. What was he thinking? Was a car really worth living his worst nightmare? What if Oliver didn't honor the deal? Or worse, what if the stories were actually true? He swallowed the lump in his throat as he shoved a sandwich into his backpack. He had food, water, a blanket, a flashlight, and his phone. Everything he should need to survive the night. It would be fine, he hoped. Wasn't sure if you'd show. Oliver smirked as Mark walked up to meet him on the rickety front porch. Well, I did. I'm here. Mark fidgeted nervously, staring up at the house, its windows gazing down at him like large, dark eyes. So here are the rules. You have to stay here until sunrise. You leave before then, the deal's off. No car for you. And you have to stay alone. No calling for help from your little friends or your mommy and daddy. I'll be back to check on you in the morning and make sure you really did it. Got it? Got it. Mark nodded. Good luck. <laughs> I'm rooting for you. Really? Oliver turned to leave, then glanced over his shoulder for one final dig. Oh, and uh, watch out for the ghost. I heard if she gets you, there won't even be bones left over. Night! And with that, he walked away. Mark stared down at the doorknob, preparing himself to walk inside. He could still leave. He could turn and run all the way back home. But then Oliver would be right, and he would be a coward. No, he was going to do it. He wasn't some scared little kid anymore. It was just a big, empty house, nothing more. He slowly turned the doorknob, pushed, and with a long, low creak, the door opened to the darkness within. Against his better judgment, Mark instinctively called out, Hello? There was, thankfully, no response, just his voice echoing in the vast, empty room. He let out a small sigh of relief and pulled the flashlight out of his backpack, switching it on. He cast its beam around the front room of the house, illuminating water damage, cobwebs that he could only hope were no longer housing any spiders, and a whole lot of plastic-wrapped furniture. As he walked into the living room, he was struck by just how ordinary it all seemed. It was creepy, of course, like any place made for a living that had been deprived of its purpose for far too long, but it wasn't nearly as bad as his imagination had built it up to be. He had been picturing black candles, symbols drawn on the floor in blood, a skeleton perched on the couch, bats hanging from the ceiling. But there was none of that. No ghosts, no signs of danger, 
This was just mostly sort of sad. Once a home, now just a house, emptied out and left to decay. He could get through the night just fine. As soon as he thought that, he felt something scurry across his foot and let out a scream. The flashlight revealed it to be a large rat running from his sudden intrusion and looking for a place to hide. He clutched his chest, catching his breath. It's just an animal. It's fine. It's not going to hurt you, he reminded himself. Now that some of the mystery was gone, he was starting to wonder what the rest of the house looked like. What had once been breathless fear was replaced with a certain morbid curiosity. If he had to be here all night, he might as well explore. Hey, he thought to himself with a smile. Exposure therapy really works. Scared of a haunted house? Just go roaming around inside the middle of the night. You'll be cured. He sat his backpack down next to the stairs, keeping a grip on his flashlight, and began to investigate the rest of his greatest childhood fear. He walked through the dining room, taking in the ornate chandelier hanging from the ceiling, the long, long table fit for housing at least a dozen guests. He wandered into the kitchen, the appliances rusty from neglect, the oven and stove where someone once prepared their nightly dinners, all the pieces of life strewn about like an unfinished jigsaw puzzle with no one to pick up the pieces. Suddenly, Mark heard something coming from the other room. It couldn't be, but it sounded like footsteps on the stairs. Someone, or something, walking down descending the staircase toward him. He held his breath, heart pounding so hard he couldn't hear it in his ears. The footsteps stopped, and the house was silent once again. Then, slowly, deliberately, he heard the same footsteps heading back up until they faded away too quiet to hear anymore. That wasn't his imagination. He was not alone in the house. Carefully, he tiptoed back the way he came, careful to not make too much noise walking across the creaking floorboards. When he reached the stairs, he saw no signs of anyone else. In fact, there was nothing there at all. Wait, where was his backpack? He scanned the floor, certain he had just overlooked it, forgetting where he sat it down. But no matter where he looked, it wasn't there. His stomach dropped with a sudden realization. Whoever he had heard coming down the stairs must have taken it. He thought briefly about abandoning it and just running out the front door and never looking back. But his phone was in there. If his parents found out, he'd be grounded for months. Not to mention, he wouldn't have a phone. But what if whoever took it was dangerous? He couldn't be sure, but something in his gut told him he needed to go upstairs and check it out. He considered the weight of the flashlight in his hand. If someone attacked him, would it be enough to defend himself? He sure hoped so. With shaky hands and unsteady legs, he began to climb the stairs to the second floor of the house. Maybe whoever had taken his backpack was just as scared of him as he was of them. It was a comforting thought, though the comfort was short-lived. As he started down the upstairs hall, preparing to search the first bedroom, he heard a door creak open behind him. He turned and froze in wide-eyed terror at the sight. There was a figure there, emerging from the shadows. A pale woman with long, dark hair wearing a white nightgown, reaching out to him with a clawed hand. Get out, a voice rasped. Mark shrieked, dropped the flashlight, and tore back down the stairs. He ran to the front door, but as his hand touched the doorknob, a hand grabbed his ankle and pulled. He toppled over, landing on the ground with a painful thud. Please, he sobbed, shaking from fear. Don't hurt me. I'll leave, I'll leave. I'm so sorry. Don't kill me. He braced himself for an unearthly voice for pain, but instead he heard gleeful cackling. He opened his eyes and saw Oliver standing above him. I knew you couldn't do it. You're such a chicken, he smirked. What? Mark stammered. Come on, did you really think I was going to give you my car? Are you stupid? Oliver scoffed. Clearly. Mark followed the sound of the new voice coming down the stairs. There was Chase, one of Oliver's equally awful friends. He still believes in haunted houses. Did you like my work? I made myself. He held up what Mark could now see was a prop. A mannequin dressed up like some kind of ghostly woman. You gave it a good try, but I think it's time for you to run along home now. Oliver sneered. Yeah, run home. Ugh! Chase's taunt was cut off as he fell against the banister suddenly. What the hell? Who pushed me? He whirled around, but there was no one on the stairs with him. Still, Mark could hear the sound of footsteps hammering past Chase and toward him and Oliver. What happened next shocked him to his core. Oliver was dragged to his feet by the collar of his shirt, pulled by an unseen force. Then, with a loud thwack, something invisible hit him square in the nose. Ow! He cried out. But before he could react anymore, he was dealt another blow to the stomach. 
doubling over in pain. What the? Something swept his legs out from under him and he fell hard, head hitting the floor with a crack. Then it was quiet. Oliver was still breathing, but very much unconscious, blood trickling from his nose. Screw this! Chase yelled, bolting out the door. As Mark scrambled toward the door to follow him to run home before he could be attacked next, he saw his backpack sliding across the floor toward him. Thanks for the sandwich, a female voice said, though he couldn't see the source. I love peanut butter. Y you're welcome, he stammered before grabbing his bag and sprinting all the way home. As the story of the haunted house began to spread, rumors and local news reports alike reached the ears of the SCP Foundation. Foundation staff in the area placed infrared cameras around the abandoned house, and the footage captured a human heat signature. Whatever was in that house, it was no ghost. Using infrared cameras to track the entity, it was quickly brought into custody. Before long, the entity was opening up to the Foundation, and she offered to cooperate willingly in exchange for warm food and shelter. So, the invisible woman was taken to a nearby Foundation site and given the official classification SCP-347. SCP-347 is a young adult woman, standing at approximately 164 centimeters tall. For all intents and purposes, she is a completely average woman, with one exception, she is completely invisible to the naked eye. This includes her body, as well as everything inside of it, including her blood, skin, and hair samples. Though the cones and rods of the human eye must be visible in order to see, SCP-347's vision has registered as normal following extensive tests. She refers to herself with the name Claudia, though this is assumed to be an alias inspired by Claudia Rains, the lead actor in The Invisible Man. Her real identity, if she indeed has one, has not yet been confirmed. Aside from her invisibility, SCP-347's only other notable traits are an ability to pick locks, a talent for thievery, and the ability to swallow small objects in order to turn them invisible, and then cough them up at a later time without any sickness or discomfort. She seems to crave human contact and socialization, becoming frustrated when she is ignored. She will act out in these cases by pranking people and rearranging and hiding their things. When she is left alone with someone who is sleeping, she has been known to stroke their hair, touch their face, or tuck them in. She does this, she says, because it just feels right. However, those it is done to tend to describe the behavior as unnerving. Though she is invisible in terms of visible light, she can still be seen using infrared or ultraviolet cameras. SCP-347 is currently contained at Site 1, kept in a 5 meter by 5 meter room monitored with an infrared camera. The room has an attached bathroom complete with a shower and bathtub, a queen-size bed, two armchairs, a desk and a swivel chair, several bookcases, a TV, and a DVD player. Her bookcases are filled with books, mainly adventure stories, romance novels, and art books, as per her request. She has also been permitted DVD copies of any movies or television shows that she asks for, as long as they predate her arrival at the SCP Foundation. New releases may be added, but only after prior approval from the research team. Though she does not frequently wear clothes, she is to be provided with any clothing that she requests, as well as a collection of makeup and wigs. She has been encouraged to dress up to her heart's content, as it allows Foundation staff to more easily gauge her location at any given time. While she is inside, the door to her room must remain locked. At least two staff members must check her door every hour for signs of tampering with the lock. The door may only be unlocked to allow staff in and out for interviews, research, and the delivery of meals and other requested items. She thoroughly enjoys human company and will chat, joke, and even flirt with those who visit her room. She is permitted to leave her containment if and only if she is accompanied by a staff member with at least level 2 security clearance, as well as wearing a layer of grease paint on her face and gloves on her hands. This allows the staff to see her hands and facial expressions. While she is out and about, staff are instructed to treat her with respect and avoid making any rude or crass comments about her invisibility, or her state of dress or undress. If she attempts to escape, she is to be returned to her room and locked inside. If the staff are unable to detect SCP-347's location, they will be given infrared heat vision goggles and instructed to keep an eye out for unusual phenomenon. Dr. Wrights added an addendum to her official file warning male personnel to politely decline any advances that SCP-347 makes towards them. His note reads, She's an invisible kleptomaniac. 
When you leave afterward, you're gonna realize three seconds too late that you don't have your keys in your pocket anymore, and you will be held accountable for whatever happens. Besides, the last thing we need is an invisible pregnancy, Dr. Wrights. Yeesh. When she was first contained, SCP-347 had regular violent outbursts and displayed signs of emotional instability, including compulsive theft and depressive episodes during which she would give all surrounding people the silent treatment. Her condition has improved gradually over time, with the application of regular counseling sessions intended to help her heal from the trauma caused by years of complete isolation and being unseen by the world around her. Several of the research staff studying Claudia have suggested that she be introduced to other SCPs, particularly those who are humanoid and considered to be non-threatening. She might, they posit, benefit from social interaction with other anomalous beings that she can relate and connect to. This, in addition to her therapy, could improve her mental and emotional state significantly. After all, just because she's invisible, that doesn't mean she has to feel invisible too. Claudia has expressed a great deal of interest in this idea stating that it would be nice to have some friends on the inside who aren't being paid to talk to her. Though no matchups have been approved as of yet, several anomalies have been proposed should the program be put into action. SCP-507 was brought up in conversation by more than one researcher, given his harmless nature, friendly demeanor, and fascination with the paranormal. He supported the idea enthusiastically, stating that he would be thrilled to meet a real-life invisible person. SCP-343 has also asked to meet with Claudia, believing he can potentially help her overcome some of her emotional difficulties and offer her some much-needed comfort. Other potential anomalies to introduce to Claudia include SCP-073 and SCP-056, though Claudia's flirtatious nature might complicate the latter. Everybody wants to be known, to be acknowledged, and recognized for the person that they know themselves to be. For SCP-347, it once seemed as if having that simple desire, that human need, met would be impossible for her. But now, for better or for worse, as long as she's in the custody of the SCP Foundation, Claudia can make something approximating a normal life. She can, at last, be seen. Now go check out SCP-811 Swamp Woman and SCP-953 Polymorphic Humanoid for even more lovely and not-so-lovely anomalous ladies.